Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We're gonna start, people are still coming in, but um, I'm gonna give a brief intro. Um, on behalf of the Sabin Center, welcome to our webinar, Advisory Opinions on Climate Change, an overview of a quartet of simultaneous requests. I'm Maria Antonia Tigre, the Global Climate Litigation Fellow at the Sabin Center, and it's my, um, my biggest pleasure and honor to have this excellent set of speakers and moderators joining us for the next few hours. So before I introduce our moderators, let me provide a little bit of context on this unprecedented moment that we are living in in climate litigation. In recent years, the number and diversity of climate-related lawsuits has, um, have increased significantly. Over 50 national jurisdictions in 18 regional and international courts and tribunals, United Nations treaty bodies, quasi-judicial bodies, or other adjudicatory bodies now handle such cases. As of yesterday, April 26, the Sabin Center's global and U.S. climate litigation databases jointly include 2,276 cases. The expensive growth of climate litigation results from the still inadequate climate ambition worldwide. Although countries have improved their mitigation and adaptation targets, internationally determined contributions submitted to the UNFCCC, the long-term temperature goals and objectives of the Paris Agreement remain a distant future. The impact of such inadequate action is far from insignificant. The 2023 IPCC Sixth Assessment Report released a month ago provides a grim perspective of our current and future reality. The report details the devastating consequences of rising greenhouse gas emissions worldwide, as well as the increasingly dangerous and irreversible risk, risks should we fail to change our course. With 1.1 degrees Celsius of global temperature rise, changes to the climate system are already occurring in every region of the world from rising sea levels um, to more extreme weather events to rapidly disappearing sea ice. Additional warming will increase the magnitude of these changes. Every uh, 0 0.5 degrees Celsius of global temperature rise, for example, will cause discernible increases in the frequency and severity of heat extremes, heavy rainfall events and regional droughts. Rising temperatures also heighten the probability of reaching dangerous tipping points in the climate system that once crossed can trigger self-amplifying feedbacks that in further increase global warming, such as stalling permafrost or massive forest dieback. Setting such reinforcing feedbacks in motion can also lead to other substantial, abrupt and irreversible changes to the climate system. The IPCC report was described as an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. But he also said that the climate crisis can only be overcome through cooperation between peoples, cultures, nations, and generations. What we're seeing now with climate litigation, with the advent of these separate processes of advisory opinions, shows not only hope for some legal benchmarks to be adopted, on the rights and responsibilities for the climate crisis, but also of that cooperation. Stakeholders around the world are now turning to courts worldwide to help define the responsibilities of states and for corporations in light of the climate crisis. However, until recently, a significant gap remained. No international court or tribunal had yet been prompted to answer the question of states' responsibilities under international law for climate change. This prospect is now here. In a span of a few months, a quartet of requests for advisory opinions from international and regional courts and tribunals was announced. In the case of advisory opinions, courts and tribunals are not asked to settle disputes between parties. Instead, they are asked to provide their views on specific matters related to the interpretation of norms of international law. When giving an advisory opinion, the court makes judicial pronouncements that do not possess binding force or attract any compliance obligation between parties. However, advisory opinions have distinct and intrinsic value as authoritative st statements of law. The institutional reputation of the International Court or Tribunal rendering an advisory opinion explains the weight that opinion carries regardless of its lack of binding effect. While cases make law compared with, bind with binding judgments, advisory opinions have tremendous potential to unveil state's obligations under international law. While binding decisions are analytically connected with the intricate facts of the dispute, advisory opinions provide uh, a facts detached interpretation of international law. 
Accordingly, unless there are compelling reasons to depart from that interpretation, this understanding will likely guide the court or tribunal in future cases. Furthermore, these advisory opinions will certainly impact ongoing domestic and regional climate litigation as well. As courts continue to define the obligations of states under the UNFCCC and Paris Agreement, the narratives these judicial bodies adopt will shape the legal framework for addressing the climate crisis in the coming years. Within that context, in 2022 and 2023, several requests were made for advisory opinions on climate change from international courts and tribunals. First, in December 2022, the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law, COSIS, asked the International Tribunal of the Law of the Seas to provide an advisory opinion on the obligations of states to the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas in relation to preventing, reducing, and controlling pollution of the marine environment and preserving and protecting it in the face of climate change impacts. Second, in January 2023, Chile and Colombia submitted a request to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights seeking clarification on state obligations regarding climate change, particularly with respect to shared responsibilities between countries. Third, in October 2022, Vanuatu announced it would request an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on the obligations of states under international law to protect the climate system and other parts of the environment for present and future generations. The UN General Assembly adopted a resolution by consensus posing questions on this topic to the ICJ at the end of March 2023. And fourth, a pan-continental initiative of African civil society and community-based organizations is planning to request an advisory opinion from the African Court of Human and People's Rights on the human rights obligations of African states in relation to the impacts of climate change. While the advisory opinions are not expected before 2024, with the ICJ opinion anticipated in early 2025, they already represent a historic turning point for global climate litigation, heralding a new era of hope and renewal. These initiatives are individually significant, of course, but their combined force is even more powerful. They have been described as a form of lawfare, which aims to use the law and climate litigation in particular to advance the diplomatic and political goals of small island developing states and global south countries in addressing the impacts of climate change on their lands and communities. The fact that these initiatives are coming from Global South jurisdictions and vulnerable communities is not surprising. Through grassroots movements, this wide variety of stakeholders from civil society organizations have reclaimed power over the consequences of climate change, reclaiming their role as actors in fighting the climate crisis rather than uh, continue to be perceived as victims of climate change and finding innovative solutions um, based on international law to push for more effective action in a climate that has been slow to respond. Although climate academic debate on these advisory opinions is already underway, it is valuable to examine these initiatives together in addition to individually as they overlap significantly and a transnational approach is consistent with the trend of global climate litigation. Courts often look at each other look to each other for guidance when faced with unprecedented legal questions. So it is likely that these initiatives will somehow engage with each other, interpreting obligations consistently and holistically. Within this context, the Saving Center has organized this webinar to facilitate a comparative analysis of the recent advisory opinion requests on climate change. The webinar organized by the Saving Center's peer review network on global climate litigation features three panels moderated by rapporteurs from different countries. The first panel, moderated by Liam Minklings from Client Earth and our rapporteur from Germany, will discuss the mobilization behind the requests with campaigners and government representatives. The second panel, moderated by Dina Luping from the University of Southampton and the Global Network of Human Rights and the Environment, and a rapporteur for the Court of the Economic Community of West, West African States, will invite legal experts to provide a comparative analysis of the legal questions posed. The third panel, moderate, uh, which was moderated by me, actually, uh, on some last minute changes, uh, will offer practical insights into the legal process and timelines of the requests. Um, so lastly, I, I got a few very short announcements uh, before we start, but um, today the Saving Center is also launching the status report on principles of international and human rights law relevant to climate change, which is a report that we have um, done for the Youth Climate Justice Handbook, uh, for the 
World's Youth for Climate Justice and the Pacific Students Fighting Climate Change, and it's part of their Youth Justice ju uh, Youth Climate Justice Handbook that's going to be launched jointly, I think, next week. So I can share the links of, uh, for that. And the report provides um, high-level guidance on the legal issues to be analyzed by the ICJ and identify certain key relevant principles of international environmental law, international human rights law, and issues of intergenerational uh, equity. And it's supposed to help um, countries and as they prepare their written submissions to the ICJ. And finally, this webinar is also a preface to an, an in-person workshop on global climate litigation and the rise of international adjudication to be held in Southampton in June for which abstract submissions are open. So we will also put the link in here if you wanted to submit your, uh, your abstracts. So without further ado, I leave it to Leah to kick off our conversation for the first panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria Antonia. And um, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, as mentioned by Maria Antonia, I am a lawyer for public international law with Client Earth, a legal environmental organization and I'm really excited to be welcoming um, to panel number one how did we get here um, Lucia Solano, Payam Akavan, Vishal Prasad and Richard Nakumbe. Um, I'm just going to introduce the panelists really quickly and then hand over um, because they have many interesting things to share with us today. Lucia Solano is the legal advi advisor to the permanent mission of Colombia to the United Nations, prior to which she serves in the International Legal Affairs Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the legal advisor to the Embassy of Colombia in the Netherlands. Colombia, together with Chile, requested the advisory opinion from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Haya Makavan is professor and senior fellow at Massey College, University of Toronto. As a lawyer, he has appeared, just to name a few, by the way, before the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Payam is also the chair of the expert committee advising the Commission of Small Island States and their advisory opinion request to ITLOS. Um, Vishal Pras uh, Prasad is an MA student at the University of the South Pacific with a background in politics and international affairs. He is a campaigner with the Pacific Island Students Fighting Climate Change, the youth organization behind Vanuatu's request for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. And finally, uh, Richard Nakombe, he's the climate change and biodiversity coordinator at the Institute for Human Rights and Development in Africa. He is also the secretariat lead of the Pan-African Coalition that is working on filing requests for an advisory opinion before the African Court of Human and People's Rights. Uh, I'm really happy to have you all here today. Um, Vishal, I would hand over to you um, as the um, request for an advisory opinion before the ICJ was the first one. And so I'd be very interested in hearing from you what motivated re the request, what steps were taken, and just to learn a little more about your perspective. Thank you so much, Leah, and uh, thank you, everyone. It's a, it's great to be part of this webinar discussing the uh, the campaign for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. Um, as as mentioned, um, yeah, this campaign began in two thousand and nineteen. It was a campaign that began in a classroom in Vanuatu, in at the University of the South Pacific, um, and it was really an attempt to for students. There were twenty seven law students who were considering how international law or what could be done about. Uh, two things really. One, the the state in which we're in, the impacts of climate change becoming very severe, very existential as time progresses, and with the second being uh, climate responses not being adequate in responding to these challenges. And so these were two key motivations behind um, behind the push for or behind the request or the campaign to seek for an advisory opinion. And we were very interested in seeing how could we really catalyze greater state action by helping states understand their obligations, not just under a single uh, international agreement, such as the Paris Agreement, but under the whole host of international law as the request puts forward. So it looks at asking uh, asking the courts to clarify international obligations beyond uh, the Paris Agreement and looking at the other uh, international conventions, such as human rights treaties and conventions. Um, and so what, what, what happened was after that initial understanding of, um, okay, we, we need to get an advisory opinion, the, the next step was to understand how do you get an advisory opinion? And we were very clear at the, uh, at the, at the very outset that it, this needs to come from the, inter from the United Nations General Assembly because the General Assembly has the mandate to request an opinion uh, over a variety of themes and would not be restricted by 
uh, or would not be excluded, uh, exclusive, sorry. Um, and so um, we, and in order to get the advisory print through the General Assembly, we needed a majority vote of the General Assembly at that time. We were really focused on getting 97 states on board. Um, and so with that understanding, we, we started reaching out to um, uh, Pacific leaders at the first uh, first instance. The government of Vanuatu was the first government uh, that and the first country to express positively its intention and support behind the campaign. Um, as mentioned, they formally announced their support in 2021 um, and, and have been championing this in the formal diplomatic space since then. But what we've been doing since then as the civil society campaign has really been around trying to mobilize support, trying to educate and, uh, and, and advocate for this campaign. This isn't a this isn't a really easy or fairly um, easy campaign to communicate about or get people to understand because it uh, it has a lot of technical um, as as many of us would understand has very technical nuances and has um, and as can be quite exclusive in, at times and so we were working towards explaining um, um, and and getting people to understand this campaign at the first instance and through that we were able to build um, a lot of networks a lot of support in terms of endorsements that came about we call them friends of the initiative um and then we had uh we had built uh, really uh, alliances throughout um throughout our journey into this campaign at, uh, throughout the 3 years of this campaign since 2019 um and these alliances these organizations have been a part of the campaign um, since then, and we're very happy that we've also managed beyond the Pacific to get campaigners from other parts of the world, and that's how the World's Youth for Climate Justice uh, was founded. Um, it, it was basically a group of campaigners from different regions of the world, equally interested in seeking an advisory opinion and concerned about the state of state we find ourselves in, working with, with us, working together with the alliances to really push governments to support this campaign. Um, and in uh, November, we had uh, the first draft of the resolution, November last year, the first draft of the uh, resolution come out. Um, and that was um, that was the, the first draft that went through subsequent um, rounds of consultations and negotiations. And it was finally put to the table, uh, put to the floor of the General Assembly on the 29th of March and historically was adopted by consensus. And so now we move into, uh, and, and just recently the court has also, I think um, for everyone's information, announced a timeline for the advisory opinion and, and for state submissions and comments afterwards. But um, what, uh, and, and just speaking on, 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 on the civil society angle, I think for us, from the very outset, the campaign was always about two things, human rights and intergenerational equity. And this was the driving force behind the campaign at the University of the South Pacific in 2019. This was still central at the formation of the WICJ, World Youth for Climate Justice, and still remains. And we were very, very interested in asking this question about what are obligations of states, as I mentioned, under international law, but not just for current generations, but for future generations as well. And so that intergenerational dynamic was very crucial and very central to our campaign. Um, Interestingly, this uh, this campaign was was uh, began in the Pacific, and I, I in the, in the brief for this uh, webinar, we asked this question about um, how did this campaign move forward, or what were the different stages. And I think it's it's very important to mention that this was a campaign that began in the Pacific and was inspired by Pacific values, and and what and 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 that has held us together. Um, and, and really the spirit of the Pacific in its resilience, in its reliance on faith, respect, tradition and culture has all been a, a strong part of this campaign. And I think it would it's seen in the different uh, campaigns, the different projects that we've launched throughout the campaign, be it animation videos, be it music videos, direct youth action on the ground, um, writing our briefs, etc. All of these have been inspired by the Pacific and its values. And, and we're very, very grateful i think uh for the alliances and for everyone uh, joining this campaign to be respectful of that and to jump on board we call it a vaca uh it's a journey of the pacific and um, we see this 
as the Pacific journeying to the, the world's highest court in, seek, in seeking greater climate justice. And so that vaca, that canoe has, has had many stopovers in many different places in the region with when the Pacific Island Forum leaders, that was the first milestone we had achieved, trying to get our Pacific leaders to endorse the campaign, uh, support the campaign by Vanuatu. And so that was our first stopover. And then once we had that uh, endorsement 2022 June, um, we then moved towards campaigning in the global global sphere by getting other regional blocks. And so we had the um, or the Caribbean community, the Organization of African Caribbean Pacific States, along with others, and then um, and then finally the the General Assembly's adoption. And so that that canoe, that vaca, is not yet at its destination. Um, we still have a long way to go. We still have the International Court of Justice to pro uh, uh, to to provide its opinion and. Um, what we're now working on is trying to ensure that that same voice that began this campaign is still co continues to inspire, still continues to advocate for those same uh, issues, those same things, uh, the same themes. And we want the ICJ to hear this. Um, Dr. Maria mentioned the status report uh, that's part of uh, 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 youth of the Youth Climate Justice Handbook. We are working on releasing that, and that is, if I was to summarize that, um, a, a condensed version of what the youth ask is um, of the court and what states could, uh, if they were interested in, we really hope states pick up on this, on the themes of human rights and intergenerational equity is something that's very dear to the Pacific, something that's very dear to the youth and civil society campaign. And that's our ask to the ICJ. And so we're putting that out for countries, for states, for interested parties to understand um, and also for states to pick up and present before the court. Um, and so I think once we're there, that would be the next stage of the of the, our journey, the next stop of the VACA. Um, and uh, and yeah, it'll be it'll be a great and exciting, as uh, already mentioned, a historic moment for climate uh, litigation for climate law as well. And so uh, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to stop there and uh, I'd like to thank you all once again for this opportunity to briefly speak about. Um, the ICJ advisory opinion campaign. Um, thank you so much, Rashan. Maybe just let me say congratulations. I mean, I think this has been an incredible campaign and incredible efforts. And, and based on what you just shared with us, also the story of how this came into existence and 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 the fact that it's all started in the classroom is really, really impressive. Um, so I, I just wanted to follow up on one, one thing quickly because I'm interested to learn from your perspective, what were the biggest challenges getting this to the UN General Assembly and getting it through the UN General Assembly? And what? how do you see these challenges changing now? Because I understand from what you just said that your campaigning will continue um, through the um, written and oral proceedings. And so I'd just also be interested in hearing how you perceive those challenges changing. Thanks, Leo, for that question. Um, we had numerous uh, challenges throughout the campaign, I think, and then these came up in many different formats. I mentioned one of them, which was trying to figure out how do we communicate this campaign. Um, this isn't a normal uh, climate change campaign where you are um, asking for uh, marching on the streets or protesting. Um, and there is a lot of um, a lot of technical uh, issues related to this. And so we had to find a way to really simplify that. And um, I mentioned some of them in uh, in in, in, in the beginning. Um, we made an animation video. That was the first, trying to summarize it for the ordinary person walking on the streets. How do you understand what an International Court of Justice advisory opinion is? And why does it matter for you to know that this campaign is going on and this, this is something worth your while? And so that, that animation video helped um, really get ordinary people to understand. And then we worked towards getting getting young people to understand this campaign. And so how do you get the attention? And music was one of the first things that we thought about. And so we worked on um, uh, putting out a music video that Bris, uh, Bris, uh, talked about this. And also, um, I think social media and, uh, and, and norm, of course, traditional media has been very influential and very helpful for us in this. Uh, and so these really helped us um, overcome the communications challenges that we had. Um, second, of course, COVID-19 was, during our campaign period, was a major challenge because it really um, shifted campaign goals, shifted campaign plans and strategies because we were now um, forced to campaign digitally, were forced to campaign from where we were and we couldn't travel. And, and that really led uh, to the birth of the World Youth for Climate Justice because if we weren't able to travel, if we weren't able to campaign where we wanted to, 
maybe there were people in those parts of the world who would be interested in campaigning. And so we worked to mobilize through networks, find campaigners, as, as I mentioned, who would be interested. And then that led us to form um, the World Youth for Climate Justice. Uh, going forward, I think that communication challenge will still remain for us um, now, even uh, probably even more for us, because we are now into, into a even more legal phase of the campaign and the Youth Climate Justice Handbook and the procedures of the court and the arguments that we would like to present and we, we are trying to make are very legal. And we also need to now think about how do we communicate this to the public? At the very at the very beginning of the campaign, we we when we made the animation video, we called it the power of the people, uh, and we really believe that the advisory opinion is uh, something that will empower people. But we need people to understand the campaign. We need people to understand that there is this this is an empowering tool, and that they can use this. And so this phase for us will be exactly about that trying to get people to understand what's happening in The Hague, how are states responding, how are states presenting their cases and their arguments, and how can ordinary people, once the advisory opinion is given, um, use it uh, as a tool for advocacy, as a tool for getting governments and, and, and corporations, et cetera, to, to really uh, ramp up ambition and action on climate change. And so I think that will remain a key part of our campaign as we go into phase two. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, next, I'll hand over to Payam as the ITLOS um, it, it timeline is the soonest one. Um, the, the first round of written submissions is due mid-June, I believe. And so I'd be really interested in hearing from you, Payam, how, you know, what, what motivated the request, how it came into being, what have the steps been since and, and how, uh, and, and also just hear some of your views, how these, um, different um, advisory opinion requests that are now obviously um, all kind of pending alongside each other, how that has also influenced um, or how they have influenced each other. Uh, thank you, Leah, to you and to the organizers for inviting me. And it's uh, wonderful to be among such uh, distinguished and uh, dear colleagues uh, at such an exciting juncture in the, in the development of international law. Um, in uh, on October 31st, 2021, on the first day of COP26, the Prime Ministers of Antigua and Barbuda in the Caribbean and Tuvalu in the Pacific concluded the agreement to establish the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law. And the Commission was inspired, uh, or rather motivated, uh, by the abysmal failure of the COP process to address the concerns in particular of uh, small island states, which are the, if you like, the canary in the coal mine of climate catastrophe. Perhaps they uh, uh, know more than uh, uh, any other uh, states uh, what the catastrophic consequences of climate change uh, are going to be and are already uh, uh, are transpiring. And it must be remembered that the um, Alliance of Small Island States uh, AOSIS was established actually in 1991, one year before the UN Framework Convention was adopted, with a view to addressing issues of climate change at a time when it was not yet really a, a topic that had uh, uh, made it squarely um, on the global agenda. And uh, what was remarkable, perhaps I can say, is, uh, were the conversations I had with the two prime ministers um, about how much of what they were desperately trying to achieve in the COP negotiations were already part of international law. Um, the uh, uh, harm principle, the question of reparations for uh, breaches of obligations were uh, blindingly obvious, but somehow a uh, subject of acute controversy in the context of negotiations. So the mandate of the commission was really to bring uh, small island states together, given the fact that they are, after all, small island states at the margins of um, uh, power realities. Uh, so the idea was to unify them with a view, not simply to requesting a particular advisory opinion, but to contributing over the long term to the uh, promotion and progressive development of principles of international law relevant to climate change. Of course, one of the unique features of the agreement is that it specifically authorizes 
the Commission to request advisory opinions pursuant to Article 138 of the ITLOS rules, which of course, in contrast to the General Assembly, does not require um, a majority vote. Um, and it is, uh, of course, uh, astonishing and a great victory that the General Assembly has unanimously adopted the resolution referring uh, uh, the question uh, in respect of climate change to the ICJ. Um, but the good thing about the ITLOS process is that the Commission is in the driver's seat and may request uh, one or several advisory opinions on number a number of questions which one can think about relevant to the protection of the marine environment. And although the marine environment is not the entirety of the environment, Part 12 uh, includes within the definition of uh, the obligations of states uh, to preserve and protect the marine environment, atmospheric and land-based pollution. And we know also that the oceans are by far the largest uh, uh, carbon sink uh, and play uh, an exceptionally central role uh, in regulating uh, global climate. So um, the uh, agreement was subsequently um, opened to uh, accession by other AOSIS members. It was duly registered with the UN Secretariat uh, under Article 102 of the UN Charter. At COP26, the Republic of Palau became the first state to deposit its instrument of accession. Since then, uh, Niue, St. Lucia, and notably Vanuatu have also become members. And I'm pleased to say that several other states are in the process um, of uh, becoming uh, members. And I, perhaps I can just emphasize here the significance of Vanuatu becoming a party to the agreement, and also the significance of Antigua and Barbuda and some of the other COSIS members playing an active role in promoting um, the UN General Assembly resolution in, in the uh, early stages, um, there is a very much uh, an awareness that these two initiatives, although distinct and separate, are very closely related and mutually reinforcing. Um, and I'm also uh, uh, pleased to say in that regard that one of the uh, 14 members of our Distinguished Committee of Legal Experts, of course, is uh, Professor Margarita Veverinka Singh, who will be on the next panel, who is the lead counsel uh, for Vanuatu. So there has been a mindfulness from the outset about the importance of uh, uh, collaborating and even coordinating um, these two initiatives uh, in parallel. Um, I would also add further to um, what our friend uh, uh, Vishal has said, which is really an inspiring story of uh, grassroots ownership of international law, that our committee of legal experts uh, is uh, remarkably diverse. It is gender balanced, includes significant cohort from the global south, which I think is another very important dimension of what we're witnessing here um, in the climate change litigation a sort of transformation of the international law community itself uh, beyond the Hague bubble, which very often uh, is hardly reflective of um, the uh, diversity of the global community. Um, just to uh, end on one note, uh, as has been uh, mentioned previously, the ITLOS request was um, filed on December 12th, and the ICJ um, General Assembly Resolution on the ICJ Advisory Opinion was um, adopted on March 29th. In the meanwhile, um, ITLOS has uh, fixed June 16th as the time limit for the submission of written statements, and several states and international organizations have indicated their uh, intention to participate in this process. And it is likely, though not official yet, that the hearing will be held already in September of this year, and that uh, we will probably have an advisory opinion from ITLOS in early 2024. Um, and we should bear in mind that the ICJ registrar has scheduled January 24th of 2024 
as the date for the second of two written pleadings for the ICJ advisory opinion. So it will almost certainly be the case that there will be already an ITLOS advisory opinion before the ICJ uh, holds a hearing. And one of the questions is how the jurisprudence of this specialized tribunal um, will shape the jurisprudence um, of the uh, ICJ, which will be subsequent in time. And I will just add uh, uh, end with one brief thought, which I think is very important for all of us who want this to be a meaningful process uh, that will genuinely push the envelope and achieve a measure of progress. There is, of course, an important dimension to these requests for advisory opinions being a lightning rod that will mobilize the international community and civil society. That is a, a good in itself. But in terms of jurisprudence, uh, we need to be mindful that a restatement of abstract principles is likely to be less useful um, than scientific evidence, which persuades these international courts and tribunals to speak about the specific content of uh, state obligations. And we certainly hope that ITLOS will rise to the occasion uh, and provide an opinion that will go beyond a restatement of principles of due diligence and other principles, which by now are relatively uh, uh, settled and, and, and obvious to, uh, if you like, put some teeth in those obligations so that the jurisprudence can have a meaningful effect on subsequent negotiations uh, and the like. So with that, I will stop and thank you once again for this uh, kind invitation. Um, thank you so much, Paya. Maybe I can just ask one follow-up question. You mentioned um, just now that, um, you know, the the um, commission has the opportunity to not just ask one um, advisor, don't just request one advisor opinion, but more than one. And so I would be interested in in hearing what kind of motivated the questions that are now put before the tribunal. Like, what was the thinking kind of behind? focusing on this for the time being? Well, I think that, that part 12 of UNCLOS is the most uh, obvious uh, part of the convention in respect of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so as a point of departure, um, this would be uh, 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 sort of the opening salvo in, in engaging the tribunal in what could be a um, long-term uh, conversation, if you like, between uh, unclosed states parties and the tribunal. Uh, we have this example in the domestic context where on significant constitutional questions, there are references to Supreme Courts so that the legislature and the executive, for example, can engage with the judiciary uh, in a kind of a, a, a dialogue, uh, each shaping the other. Um, so at present, there is not necessarily any intention to immediately request yet another request, but I'm just saying that that uh, option now exists, um, given the differing uh, rules of procedure applicable to, to, to uh, uh, ITLOS as compared to the uh, ICJ, and it remains to be seen um, after we receive this opinion, what would be the next steps and I just wanted to also emphasize that COSIS has also supported very clearly um, the ICJ advisory opinion, and it remains to be seen whether it will also participate in some of the other advisory opinion processes, which will be the subject of this panel. Thank you so much, Payam. Lucia, I'll um, go over to you. So at the beginning of this year, um, Colombia and Chile requested an advisory opinion from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Um, and so I would be interested in hearing if you could provide us with a little more context and background on the requests. And also, um, having read the questions, you know, which which spread across several pages, what kind of led to 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 the questions and and the kind of different, yeah, the the many different entry points um for, for that advisory opinion. Sorry, I can't hear you.
Does that work now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so um, so thank you so much for the question and thank you, thank you um, to you and to, um, to the organizers for this very, very timely uh, conversation. Um, well, it's, it's obviously a very different process in the, in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and the, we don't need to, to campaign, we don't need to uh, get votes, we don't need to go to, to, a, to a adoption of a resolution. Um, you simply need a state willing to go to the court because the court, um, the advisory opinions of the Inter-American Court of, of Human Rights are open for any state or any organ of the Organization of American States. So what you need is really the willingness and, and the resolve to certainly present a request for an advisory opinion. And in, in the case of Colombia and Chile, well, first of all, Colombia has experience in advisory opinions. We have presented quite a few requests uh, to the Inter-American Court, but also especially the, the request we presented in 2016 on, on what we thought was going to be a, a very specific questions about conflicting obligations in environmental law, and especially in, in, the, in the Southwestern Caribbean Sea, um, became a much bigger, uh, perhaps result than we expected. We actually anticipated a much uh, you know, limited response from the court in that process in 2016 that the court decided in 2017. Um, but the, the court took the opportunity of the, by the request that Colombia presented to advance the, the, the law of you know, environmental law in a way that we didn't think it was going to be so, so progressive. I mean, the court is famously known as being very progressive, um, but it went well beyond what we actually expected in 2016. And, and it was very good for, for, for environmental law, certainly, and the, the recognition by the court of the existence of a right to a healthy environment was major. And it's actually uh, still not uh, as you know as strongly uh, recognized in other systems. So for inter-American uh, system and for for our states, we already have obligations that go beyond what other uh, other might have in this realm. But so that gave us sort of uh, uh, the weight and the and the knowledge of the system, but also of what we can expect from the court. So once you know, especially on these environmental um, matters, that sometimes in, in other courts the courts are more limited and they try to, to maintain a you know, more strict uh, approach. In the case of the Inter-American system, um, it isn't like that. So with that precedent and having had that, that experience before, and also especially because we, we are, and we have always been very active in environmental law and in law of the sea uh, and climate change, uh, also is a matter that for Colombia is very, very important. Um, you know, historically we have been, uh, you know, it has been recognized that Colombia came up with the original idea of having a, a, the SDGs, for example. So it was an idea from the delegation of Colombia in the Rio uh, conference, and it became what it is now. So we are active in this field. So we, we didn't need necessarily, uh, you know, to, to convince anyone on the importance of environmental law and of advancing environmental law, but we needed uh, the political decision. And uh, it was in a, in a way aligned with the sort of the, the interests of Chile and, and what we really needed was uh, at that moment sort of have all the stars aligning and it happened. We had two governments that care for, about similar things, two governments that are active on environmental law, two states that know how to litigate in international courts and tribunals, two states that have, rec have had recourse to, um, to the inter-American system on, 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 on these processes. So you had you know, all, the, all, all the elements you needed for a, for a good um, you know, idea. Uh, and the idea sort of became bigger and bigger. And once we realized that, first of all, that the, the court, the Inter-American Court has this freedom that also the other courts have, but, but the Inter-American Court uh, uses it quite often uh, of reshaping the question of, of the, uh, you know, sort of uh, saying what, what the courts thinks states need. Um, so we knew that we can either just send one question to the court and, and leave it some, somewhat um, open and the court would say whatever we wanted to say, but we really wanted concrete answers because um, there's a lot of law, there's a lot of, of jurisprudence, there's a lot of um, you know instruments that we can refer to, but we had specific concerns and we had a specific questions that we wanted the court to ask, and that's why we ended up with this amount of questions. It's, they are like 25 or something. Um, so it was it was a, it was a, the two states working together on on which are really the questions we want the court to answer, which are really the things that we're concerned about, and it's a lot of things, and 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 this is not just you know whether we have obligations or not. It's, it's much beyond that. And as you, as you can see from the request, and I think that it's already available in English, I think so. Um, you have questions on, on the duties of, of prevention. Of, obviously, this is a court of human rights, so it has to be based on human rights instruments. 
and, and obviously the, the request was based on the American Convention on Human Rights and also the, the Escazú Agreement on, on the protection of, of the environmental uh, defenders, uh, because we thought those were the main concerns that, that we still had open. Um, as I said, we already know more or less what the obligations of the states are, but in this area that we, we wanted more specific uh, um, answers from the court or guidance from the court. So there, there are these you know, sort of questions of the duties of prevention, how can we prevent uh, uh, on the basis of science from these uh, things to continue to, to spread and uh, what are the responsibilities of states with regard to that duty of, of prevention. Then we have a second track on the right to life, which is very specific, obviously linked to, to the advisory opinion 23 on, on the right to a healthy environment. Then we had a, a third track on, on different obligations, especially due uh, to children and to uh, especially vulnerable uh, populations, which of course is very important in our region. We have uh, uh, several of those uh, uh, populations suffering from the, the adverse effects of climate change already. So we wanted specific uh, uh, you know, uh, guidance from the court on what do, do states have to do with regard to, to its own um, uh, citizens. Um, and then the, the third, the fourth, sorry, track is on consultation procedures, on information, on what kind of uh, information do we have to uh, make publicly available to, to anyone? And what, especially if you have a, like a judicial process, should, should those processes be more public? Um, so that kind of thing that we have had, we have had quite a lot of litigation in the domestic systems on, on climate change or, or rights of the environment or things like that. So the questions are more related to, you know, how do we have to sort of make this more, more known or more available to the general um, you know, public. And then we had a, a, a fifth, track, sixth, fifth track on the protection of human rights defenders, uh, which again is a very sensitive uh, aspect in the region. They have been suffering uh, a lot of, 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 of you know, issues. So we wanted the, the court to sort of uh, give us more, more guidance on, especially in, in light of the Escazú agreement, um, you know, what else can we do beyond having the agreement? What else can we do in, in the region to defend uh, human rights and, and international environmental law uh, defenders. And then the last track is on um, shared but differentiated responsibilities, which is perhaps a track that is more related to the questions that have been asked to the International Court of Justice and to the um, uh, to ITLOS. Um, but, but as you can see, uh, the, this obviously, as I said before, the fact that this is a court of human rights sort of guides the kind of questions you can ask to, to the court, but also the fact that we already um, we anticipate that the court is going to be very progressive. We, we know that the court has, has been, and, and, and we expect that, and we count on that in a way. But what we wanted were, were, was more, okay, we know that we have a, quite an advanced body of law, but how do we concrete, you know, put those in concrete obligations for the states? So what we are asking for here is guidance for the states to implement our obligations domestically, and also whether we can have, and, and this is a very interesting part of, of the way I see it, uh, of our request is, about how we can work together. It's not just about you know what Colombia owes to Colombians or to the Col Colombians, people who are in, in Colombia at a certain moment, but also how can we cooperate? How can uh, the rights to, or the duties to cooperate with other states in the region, um, you know, how can those be applied in practice? And that's, that's all you know, what we had behind it. It's, it's more, how do we have concrete obligations? How do we apply those in practice? And we want the court's guidance on that. We know, as always, with any advisory opinion, that you know the court is going to to issue a, its its decision, and and it's going to be uh, you know on the states to implement them because it's still have an advisory opinion. Uh, but we take advisory opinions from the court very seriously. We know that the court is going to do a big uh, 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 you know interpretation and a, a big job of researching. Also, because the inter-American system has this very nice uh, feature, uh, the way I see it which is that the court opens uh, um, you know, the, the request to, to anybody who wants to comment on it. So we, you know, whoever wants to send a comment, they, they can do it and they can just send it online to, to, a, to an email address and, and the court is going to read those things. So we want the input from academia, we want the input from the scientists, we want everybody coming together to sort of decide or, or you know, to help the court decide which are the concrete obligations that states have. So this, you know, as a, with any advisory opinion, obviously you, you and this is just to, to summarize, um, you, we needed a, a state willing to take the, the, you know, the decision, obviously to carry the weight of, you know, whatever decision the court, uh, you know, comes, comes with, um, it's going to be, uh, you know, 
our responsibility in a way because we, we asked for it. Um, so we had this debate on whether are these too many questions, but at the same time we wanted concrete answers and, and we decided that leaving the questions too open was not going to be super helpful. Um, so that's what, how we came uh, with this long, long list of questions, but we think it's going to be very advanced. We think it's going to be also quite a fast process. The Inter-American Court is, is quite you know expeditious in the way it treats the, 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 the processes. I, I don't know if necessary. I always thought, but now I'm having doubt that the, the Inter-American Court decision were going to come first and then the it laws and then ICJ. But maybe it laws is going to come up first, maybe. So we'll see about that. Um, but it, we do think, and, and this is what it, I think it sort of connects all of them. We do think that whatever the Inter-American Court says is going to be very progressive. Um, and that should hopefully will uh, influence the decision of other courts that are more contained, more, uh, you know, more, in a way conservative um, in, in sort of, uh, you know, following the, 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 the standard of the Inter-American Court, hopefully, um, at least that's what's, what Colombia uh, would like to see, uh, but we'll see what happens there. Um, thank you so much. You touched upon one thing I wanted to ask you already, but uh, just a little more context on. So you mentioned this process is, you know, obviously different because uh, states can just request it. But I'm curious to hear to what extent civil society played into kind of the framing of the questions or or even the process. And then you also mentioned and maybe just to um a highlight for those listening that um, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, um, as opposed to ITLOS and the ICJ, has a procedure, as, as Lucia just mentioned, for amicus submissions from civil society. And, and you mentioned the court does read them in, in terms of, you know, practice of the court. Have you seen that it does really take those submissions also into consideration? Thank you so much, Leah, for the question. Well, Colombia and Chile are, are states uh, in the region and historically states that are very engaged with civil society. So this, there's always the involvement of civil society on the decisions we take, especially on this marriage, because a lot of input comes from civil society. The state doesn't have you know, the, 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 the apparatus to, to sort of be everywhere, and we have a lot of challenges. So we are always constantly in, you know, talking to civil society about what are concerns, you know, specific concerns um, that they might have. So there was some of that. But in, in deciding to present the, 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 the request to the Inter-American Court. But what really triggered the thing was, was, as I said, the fact that we have very progressive governments, governments very interested in, 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 in advancing and in being active on environmental law as we have always been. And, and it, you know, to be completely honest, it happened that we had two, um, two ministers of foreign affairs and two vice ministers of multilateral affairs at the same time that were, you know, have been very active before being in, in government on these matters. So we had the, the right elements to have a good, um, you know, a good team to present the request. So that, that was, so it was a lot of, of, of that, a lot of, of already the governments wanting to be active and already having uh, conversations with civil society. But then, and, and this is where it gets more interesting, as you said, you can always send the, the requests in writing. And what's more common is to have universities from the region presenting requests. Sometimes universities that have had any involvement in the you know, in cases in the inter-American um, system, um, especially if it when it's more human rights requests. So we'll see what happens with this one. I, I expect to have a lot of input from, from civil society, um, again, universities or think tanks or, or whatever, uh, uh, you know, because everything is it's open for everybody. Um, but what I what I think, first of all, you can send a written uh, uh, statement, but you're also going to have a chance to present it orally, right? So it's it's not just sending and the court is going to read the court the, with the presence of the full court there, and they will be able to explain in in, in you know orally or you know their, their their input. So that's also very very important and very interesting. And um, this you should you should have a, a short time limit, but you know it's enough to sort of make your your your, your arguments present your case. Um, but the court does take it seriously. The court does listen. The court does read them, and sometimes even incites some of those uh, uh, statements. Um, so we count on on civil society being very active, uh, and we count on also on their on their support and guidance. And and again, this is you know, may this be an opportunity to reiterate that anyone. Uh, that is here connected so they can send uh, information to the court and will be very, very welcome. The court will take it. Thank you so much, Lucia. That was really interesting. Um, and Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the, the initiative that you're involved in is still very new to a lot of people that have joined us today. So it'd be really great to hear from you 
um, where you are at at the moment, what what kind of inspired the work that you're doing right now, what are the next steps, and maybe also, you know, if if needed, what what are the forms of support that um, you know those that are listening into uh, in today can provide. Um, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you very much for the um, initiative uh, for the initiative to invite us to um, at least share our story in terms of what's happening uh, from the continent of Africa and especially the civic society uh, organizations that are behind uh, this um, initiative. So, what really inspired this uh, initiative was the collective understanding and consensus that um, Africa is the lowest um, um, emitter, yet also the most uh, vulnerable uh, continent, again, when it comes to uh, climate change. So there was an understanding among um, the lawyers, among the civic society organization that um, there is need to approach the highest uh, courts in the continent, which is the African Court for Human and People's Rights, to at least get clarity on the African states' human rights um, uh, obligations in the context of climate change. So this was an idea that was organically conceptualized by um, African um, lawyers as well as the civic society. Initially, uh, it was a group of few lawyers who started having uh, this conversation, but then at an early stage, it was felt that this doesn't have to become a lawyer's thing. So there was that need to at least bring in diverse uh, voices from the grassroots organization, climate change activist, um, youth, uh, women and indigenous uh, communities. So uh, the invitations were extended to all um, the groups, including community-based organization, uh, indigenous communities, other lawyers um, interested, as well as uh, the youth. So um, what we did is we had a series of meetings, uh, especially online uh, meetings uh, with all these um, uh, groups uh, interested. The idea around these meetings was to, of course, look at the utility of an advisor opinion uh, from all these different uh, groups. So what we wanted to understand is how would uh, an advisor opinion help the civic society organizations dotted around um, Africa, and then also how would this strengthen uh, ongoing uh, climate change litigation in different parts uh, of the uh, continent. Again, the other issue was also to look at the efforts that are already being done, uh, for example, by the civic society organization and different uh, groups to see how this would amplify their voices. So. One of the uh, issues that came out uh, from our discussion was to the idea to capture the struggles of different uh, groups uh, that was uh, involved. So through a series uh, of the initial meetings uh, that we had, we agreed that this was a good idea and it would help uh, basically from informing uh, action at community, local, national, and even uh, regional level. But there was then need to sort of come up with a structure uh, that would sustain this process. So what we did is we formed Formulated several working groups. So, for example, we have the working group on research and uh, drafting of the um, uh, request for an advisory opinion. We have a working group on documenting and profiling uh, of the voices of different um, Africans dotted around uh, the continent. And then, of course, we have a working group on uh, communication. Um, strategic communication and visibility of the African coalition. We also have uh, a secretariat that supports uh, the work of the um, um, working group. We have a coordinating uh, committee uh, that oversee uh, the operations of the um, uh, coalition. And then we also have a fundraising um, working group. So recently, we've also even aided uh, a technical working group uh, that involves uh, a number of global partners uh, that can support the process in terms of research, as well as uh, ideas on how uh, we can, of course, uh, go about this. So for us, there are key uh, things that we felt 
uh, are very important, especially in terms of um, laying out the campaign. So the campaign uh, would post see in our view in terms of uh, four phases. So the first phase is documentation and profiling. We do not want this to be largely just a, a legal thing, but we want uh, it to capture the voices of different um, communities uh, in all the five regions uh, of Africa. So the documentation and profiling would to carry out case studies in about maybe 10 uh, countries from the five regions of Africa to really understand uh, what are the human rights impact of um, um, climate change that communities face. So that's the first stage. And then the second stage, of course, would be to uh, the documentation and profiling to feed into the research and um, uh, drafting of the advisor opinion. So we want uh, throughout the draft of this uh, advisor opinion to see the voices of the communities. And then um, the other aspect or phase will be strategic uh, communication. So with the strategic communication, we realize the impact of uh, communicating clearly uh, our voice and also ensuring that we communicate with the same voice with other initiatives around uh, the world that are working on this advisor opinion. So we assembled uh, a, a strategic uh, communication working group that will focus on addressing uh, the media focus on um, social media campaigns and um, innovative ideas that can help uh, sort of raise the visibility of this uh, coalition. And then I think the last part uh, for us, which is also very uh, important, is the advocacy part. So with the advocacy part, what we are trying to do is to lobby and gather the voices of like-minded um, stakeholders and institutions. So for example, from an African perspective, we thought that uh, it would be important to engage uh, governments that are interested in, in the issues of climate change. So example, when you look at the um, uh, Vanuatu uh, initiative, there are quite a number of African countries uh, that supported that initiative. So we want to target some of these countries to start having engagements with them in terms of um, these uh, issues. And then uh, secondly, we want to target uh, relevant ministries. So for example, most African countries have ministries that focus on climate change or environment mental uh, issues. So we want to have engagements and in-person meetings with some of these uh, relevant ministries. And then of course, we realize that since our initiative is based on human rights, uh, we have national human rights institutions uh, that we want to engage and sort of get their buy-in. But apart from that also, uh, we have other African human rights uh, mechanisms that are interested, for example, the extractive uh, industry, environment and human rights working group of the commission. We want to engage them and of course have uh, their views on what uh, we are trying to do. So the advocates work would also involve engaging even some of the partners uh, that are part of this platform, uh, the lawyers, the other civic society uh, groups uh, that are working uh, on these um, issues. Our idea is, uh, is that we just don't want this to be uh, a, 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 a request for an advisor opinion that uh, we file and then end the day. But we want to also inspire and um, inspire our governments, even after receiving uh, the opinion of the courts, to put this into action and to, to also make sure that even the civic society, old institutions and um, governments are to account, of course, through different um, strategies. One of the issues um, that we are also uh, contemplating on is to also ensure that we have uh, exchange uh, programs with some of the uh, regional uh, platforms, like for example, the Inter-American uh, uh, Civic Society that is working with the Inter-American um, uh, system and other uh, human rights system to try and uh, exchange ideas on how we can go about this and other issues that we can also uh, share. And then, of course, we have a technical uh, working group, uh, as I indicated, that would allow us to invite a number of lawyers, a number of um, people who are good in profiling uh, 
these issues. What we want at the end of the day is we don't want uh, jurisprudence that would be opposite, of course, to what others, um, in, in other systems would have said. So we want to speak with one voice with other civic society organization um, around uh, the world. Um, of course, we have to indicate that this was an initiative that was started without uh, any uh, funding uh, support uh, from uh, the uh, any global partners. It was initially just uh, African uh, civic society organization volunteering throughout uh, the last 10 to uh, 13 months just to push uh, this around. So what I can say as I end is that now we have the institutional framework um, in place. We are clear in terms of uh, where we want to go, what we want to do. All we need to do is to just start the ball rolling in terms of drafting and also uh, carrying out this uh, case studies is indicated. Um, I'll end here, but also invite uh, Alfred to just uh, share a bit uh, in terms of some of the things that I would have left. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, maybe if I can just ask a follow-up. So based on what you just said and in, in terms of the research that you're still planning to do and the case studies, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me that like the process will take a little bit longer. And so I'd be interested in hearing how you see the the different advisory opinions and and maybe the outcomes of those d d um, advisory opinions feeding into your process, but also feeding into um, the advisory opinion of the African Court. Uh, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, as I indicated, we want to speak with one voice with other uh, regions um, around uh, the world, but of course shaped by our context and the challenges. Uh, that we face. So we are going to engage uh, different uh, um, uh, institutions and lawyers working on this. But I think if, of course, they are going, is this, if there's going to be an advisory opinion that is going to come probably before we file, we are going to, of course, have a look at that and uh, learn from what ordinarily the, the court uh, would have said or the uh, relevant regional uh, mechanism would have said. That, that will certainly uh, play a significant part in terms of, of course, the questions that we'll also submit and the issues uh, that we'll raise. But let me also indicate, uh, just in answering what uh, uh, you have asked, our idea is to, of course, file this uh, request uh, for an advisory opinion before uh, the end of this year. So around uh, November, uh, December, that's when we intend uh, to file. So what is going to make it easy is that we are, uh, it's not like the secretary is going to travel to all these countries. We have organizations already in these countries that are going to carry um, um, these case studies. And then uh, that will feed into, of course, the advisory opinion. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Sorry, Richard, just one follow-up because that just came up in the chat and I thought it'd be great. Um, there was a question about whether there's already um, information available online or some somewhere where people can learn more about your efforts. Uh, yes, so what we are trying to do, our, um, our communication uh, working group is working on putting um, this coalition uh, online. So I think in the next month or so, you are going to uh, see um, us uh, online and uh, we will be sharing all the relevant information and the steps uh, that we are taking. So as it stands, we don't have online uh, visibility, but our, work, um, our working group on uh, communication is working on that to put that on uh, online. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, maybe if I could ask the other panelists to rejoin, we have um, five minutes left and I just wanna get back to some of the questions that are in the chat. So, you know, as, as you have all made clear, these advisory opinions are targeted at or will be addressing state obligations, um, obviously in relation to climate change, but there's one question about, um, you know, concerning the obligations of um, corporations. And so the question of how you may, might perceive that some of these advisory opinions can also assist in in um, in corporate accountability. And then there was also a question about um, whether you consider that um, these advisory opinions can also um, clarify obligations in relation to biodiversity and ecosystems.
does anyone feel <laughs> like they can maybe just provide a couple of thoughts? Obviously, these are broad questions, but just some some thoughts on how this might impact biodiversity ecosystems and or states, uh, sorry, corporate accountability. Uh, maybe, Lee, I'll, I'll just jump in on the biodiversity issue. I think, once again, the connection, certainly in the context of protection of the marine environment, is absolutely obvious. Um, and the, the, the question is how um, rising uh, sea temperatures, um, acidification, deoxygenation, and so on and so forth, impact um, uh, marine biodiversity. Uh, and once again, the scientific evidence is overwhelming as to the catastrophic consequences um, which that has. And of course, that is one of the uh, very distinct and measurable aspects of harm, um, which could be raised uh, before uh, ITLOS. And in that regard, I think the recently adopted uh, convention on um, biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction will also have potentially significant impact on understanding uh, the enhanced obligations of states uh, under that regime. I, I, per, I might perhaps also add, um, clearly in the request of the uh, for the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, it was very intentionally a request on, on climate change. And, and But first of all, we, we, we can always expand. The court can always decide to, to go beyond and it has you know, to go beyond what was asked and, and make that link with, with, with these other um, areas. But it's not what we requested for the time being because again, it was quite specific on, on that concern about, you know, what are the specific obligations we have with regard to climate change and the effect it's had and is already having and it's going to have for future, present and future generations. But we can expect a lot of surprises from the court and, and it might be the case that the court decides that this is a, a, a you know, topic they would like to cover too. Um, but in any case, uh, again, the system, the process before the Inter-American uh, system, it's, it's quite easy if at some point states feel the need of, of guidance from the court on these other areas, we are very open to do it and, and to consider doing it. And so it, it's possible that in the future, and especially as, as, as um, uh, Payam said, uh, with regard to, you know, the BB&J agreement and what, what these areas are going to, to develop, we might need to to have recourse to the American court, which you know it's it's always available for 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 the states of the region to sort of clarify our obligations. So we might need to do that. Obviously, in the BBNJ agreement, the the what it's now if any request from the states parties should be presented to to ITLOS, but it, that's obviously on on the implementation of obligations of the treaty. But if there's a link to human rights, we might want to to use the the avenue of the American court, which is a more expeditious um, than what we would already. Uh, uh, you know, half in the BB and J treaty, for example, uh, whenever it, it, it's ratified. And then the last thing on, on corporations, well, the, again, in the Inter American court system, it's a court of human rights. In the in ICJ, it, it's, it's a, you know, guidance to the General Assembly uh, on, on, because it's the General Assembly asking the request on climate change. So, so all of these uh, requests have very specific uh, uh, subject matters. Um, Theoretically, it's possible, and in the Inter-American case, in the, in the first one that we presented on, on OC, um, AO, sorry, 23, um, the court did refer to the obligations of states with regard to corporations within their territory, uh, but that's a kind of a different thing. Then uh, I think that, that, that that's going to be a, a, a difficult uh, avenue, uh, but if we can make the link of that with uh, the, the, the specific jurisdiction of states uh, on their uh, advisory opinions, uh, uh, you know, competence, uh, it, it's possible, but at, at this moment, I think it's quite uh, far-fetched, a little bit far-fetched. Uh, just to um, add on, so for us, I think um, it's very good that we're having this um, discussion. So um, in terms of our discussion, issues around uh, biodiversity, I think uh, they come out clearly given the impact um, that we, we see biodiversity losses uh, in, in, in Africa. So what I would uh, say is that uh, in as much as our uh, um, request is anchored on uh, states' human rights uh, obligation, but we still have a chance to explore how um, we can uh, broaden the questions and um, ask the African courts to really uh, lay out some of these issues. So we are still at initial stages, so these are things that we are going to explore and discuss. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, as we are approaching time, 
I think I'm just going to say thank you again to all of you for joining me today. Thank you for those of you watching and thank you to the four of you for your incredible work. Um, and we look forward to seeing how these things develop. And, and as you might have seen in, in kind of the questions and, and based on the questions that I asked, I think there's a lot of interest um, in supporting. So, you know, if, if um, ideas and thoughts on how to best support you come up, please do share those. And I will now hand over to my colleague, Dina Lupin, for the second panel. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, everyone, in the first panel. Um, and welcome to the second panel. We're moving on um, speedily. So the second panel is going to be asking kind of where we are now with each of these and looking at some of the legal questions that have been asked. Um, and I'm very excited to be joined by a really fantastic um, panel of speakers, including one of the co-organizers of this event, Armando Rojo, who has very kindly stepped in at the very last minute to talk us through the ITLAS application a little bit. So Armando is a professor of international law and law of the sea and climate change law at the Catholic University of Portugal. He's also an invited professor at the Catholic University of Lille in France and the University of St. Joseph in Macau, China and Reichmann University in Israel. He's the coordinator of the Law School's Global League Research Group on Environmental Regulation, and he was the Deputy Dean of the Catholic Global School of Law between 2018 and 2022. Armando is going to be joined by um, Alfred Brownell. Alfred is an internationally recognized environmental rights activist and lawyer from Liberia and has actually just recently returned from Liberia. He is currently a visiting human rights fellow at Yale Law School in the United States and is one of the driving forces behind the initiative for an advisory opinion from the African court. Margareta, is Margareta with us? Hopefully will be with us in a moment. Margareta Weorinka Singh is an Associate Professor of Sustainability Law at the Faculty of Law of the University of Amsterdam. Together with um, Julianne Aguan, she serves as Lead Counsel for Vanuatu in the ICJ Advisory Opinion Proceedings on Climate Change. Um, and Claudia Devint, hi Claudia, is an international lawyer and political scientist from the Dominican Republic with expertise in environmental rule of law and justice, human rights, trade, investment and environment and sustainable development in the UN and the inter-American system. She's the chief executive of the Inter-American Institute on Justice and Sustainability and an international environmental law and human rights professor in globally recognized faculties of law, judicial and prosecutorial academies, as well as an author of several books and a number of publications. Thank you very much for joining us all today. Um, as I said, the second panel is gonna kind of look at where we are now, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about the commonalities between these different requests and the ways in which they're engaging with different assets, um, facets of, um, climate impacts and the obligations of states. Maybe just to mix up the order a little bit, we can start with Africa this time. Alfred, can I hand over to you? <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Dana, and uh, thank you for, to Maria and others uh, for inviting us uh, to this conversation. Um, it's interesting that uh, we know we are asked to, to talk about our process, and I'm sure um, Richard um has actually laid out where we are um so um you know almost uh, two and a half years ago we started this conversation across the continent trying to build consensus around this because as you know um not just is africa the least emitter of uh, of, of greenhouse gas emission but also africa is a place where um there's uh, a huge deficit in climate jurisprudence and a very little amount of uh uh, climate litigation has come out, and if it even come up, it's also almost uh, like a bias in a number of different regions in Africa. So we see a lot more work in East and South in Africa than in other parts of the continent as well. Um, and so um, the need to try to figure out, especially given we all talk about this, the crisis, um, the need to respond in a very more forceful, robust way uh, for frontline climate lawyers and broad about this concern, you no know, funded on an assessment that we did 
um, in West Africa um, in 2021, 2022, um, mobilizing, and then the need spreading across out of, uh, out of the continent. So in our process where we are um, in the last two and a half years, we tried to build a consensus, like Richard said, try to build an institutional arrangement, like Richard said, and brainstorming a number of different legal issues and questions. Um, we have not even got to the point where we have like an outline of what the petition will look like, um, or even working towards the draft. We've just built up those things. But what I will want to talk about more would be, you know, how to brainstorm those ideas as lawyers advantage, like, like, like you heard Richard say, um, first driven by lawyers. And then uh, given that many of the lawyers who were involved in this are actually community lawyers and frontline public interest lawyers, we say, look, we don't want this to be driven by the elites. So most times, sometimes we make those mistakes. We have lawyers who represent the defenders and represent indigenous people at the front line. Sometimes we forget that you know they are our leaders, that they are the face of the campaign, that they are our clients. And sometimes we get ourselves, you know, just up position in those processes and we forget that they should be the one driving these, these issues here. So we got reminded by a number of colleagues and like, no, 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 no. This petition has to represent the struggles of the frontline communities, the struggles of the activists at the front line, the struggles of the defenders who are indeed our first responders and what many of us in this, in this movement refer to as our firewall. So it's important that it characterize this process. So we tried, we 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 did everything uh, for almost a year to try to build that up to get a, a lot more. And it's very evolving, even where we are now with the institutional process. Um, it is very clear that um there's still a lot to to be done. There's still a lot to bring on board. So a number of things have come across us. Um, and so for example, one of the issues that are that, that uh, has been very very prominent. It's a whole question of, and someone talked about that in the last uh, uh, conversation, about protection. The whole question of zero tolerance for reprisals against those who put their life on the line for the planet across Africa. And as you will know, even many of the reports that come out, you know, about reprisals and attacks and killings and the issue of criminalization and stigmatization of defenders, Africa is a region that is totally, totally unreported, totally undocumented. In fact, um, we have defenders who actually are missing action. They stand up, they protect, put their life on the line, they get killed, they face reprisals, and we don't even hear about them. And so the conversation about zero tolerance, you know, we're hoping the court, you know, uh, the lawyers have come up those quotes, the court will be able to say there's an obligation for government to ensure zero tolerance on reprisals against those who are on the line, especially indigenous defenders, but much more specifically. Most, most specifically, the, the questions that have come about that the court will talk about the role of women indigenous defenders, those who actually are the custodian of the natural of the front line. So, these issues have come about um, in terms of the legal questions of where we are. Um, we have not yet developed a consensus around that, but it's been issues that have flown up over and over in the last year and a half as we're having these conversations that have come to a level. And so uh, I refer to them as uh, our constellation of ideas, right? We place them out. So that's one issue about that protection issue has come about. Um, I think given the vulnerability of the continent, right? Uh, how Africa is, 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 is certainly most vulnerable in this whole issue of talking about, about this process. And how, for example, you know, when you talk about the climate crisis and, you know, and, 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 and the activists, those are the front line lawyers have said this, and they said, look, you go online and you read the information, and you close your eyes and you figure out, when someone describes what a climate crisis is, what comes to your mind, what is that image? You know, and you know, this is no way of me trying to, 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 to honor mind the, the question about, the melting of the uh, of the of, of the North Pole, of so the ice or the polar bears, but that's what folks see. They see a polar bear and they see the North Pole and they see the ice melting, and like, where's Africa in this? So, an African narrative that will come up is very important. And so, that whole question of how vulnerable the region has been to bring up that narrative, and then reference the whole idea of loss and damage and reparation 
is very, very strong. How we structure that, how the court respond to that, what legal questions we present to the court, this has been very, very much being put up at the top, where there's many folks are talking about, you know, that, you know, we well, are not responsible for the historical emission. We are paying a price, right? And we're paying a price in a way that is unimaginable. That's unimaginable. And even as we try to seek adaptation, we also face reprisals, right? And, and a colleague pointed out an example. He said, look across the Mediterranean. Young Africans are trekking across the Sahara deserts. They are jumping on the boats trying to cross on, onto Europe. They are dying in their thousands in the river, on, on, on the sea. They cross over. Border guys are restricting them, trying to push them back. And they're like, we are not responsible. No, we're just trying to survive because of the climate crisis. So we are hoping the court can think about that. What does that really mean? You know, for these young people, these migrants who are trying to, to adapt to the change in climate crisis that they are faced with. So those questions are coming out in our discussions among lawyers and among colleagues and among the frontline activists. Like I said, we have not yet, you know, come. So it's part of the consultation. So we are placing these different issues here. So loss and damage reparation has come up given the vulnerability uh, that also have. But much more than that, the issue of, uh, of conflict, of conflict that's linked to the whole question of loss and damage. If you look in Africa and you look in the Sahel regions, North in Nigeria, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, what you see coming out, and that also is structured around the African narrative, is a whole question of countering terrorism and responding to the extremist processes. But no one is talking about the underlying factor that have exactly better that. The conflict between herders or the struggles between herders and farmers to have access into the arable lands to water, which has been influenced by this. So we're hoping the court can figure out what that really is. Um, there's an issue about um, extraterritorial obligations and how that is very to be, to be, to be structured into, in, 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 into the request and the ask of the court and what the implications would be in you know, Africa versus the rest of the historical emitters who are responsible what Africa is going through. Those issues have come very much and in extension, there are issues about the role of transnational corporations, you know, and what the other would be, those have come out as well. So there's also questions about uh, common but differential responsibilities and how that is structured. We have had those conversations in our dialogue, in our debate, those have been suggested by colleagues. Um, so I mean, those are issues, but as also I think coming up is, you know, focusing really on, um, on the African chapter itself, right? Um, a lot of colleagues have come up and, 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 uh, and uh, say, look, uh, it's important for us to, to, uh, to focus on, on, uh, on, on the chapter itself and uh, hoping that uh, uh, the court can, can, can uh, come up with some sort of interpretation. So for example, um, you know, the right to life, the right to food, the right to freely dispose of natural resources, the protection of indigenous people, those issues have come up and, and we are hoping the court will respond to that. Um, I think also um, that has really flown out um, a series, a series of, uh, uh, series of uh, resolutions that have been issued uh, 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 by, the African, by the African Commission. Right, I think about uh, eight or ten of those resolutions um, that have come up, and I think colleagues and uh, and the activists at the front line have been raising concerns about, you know, um, um, the interpretation of those resolutions. What 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 they really mean? Um, you know, I can probably you know I don't want to go through all the details, but I have ten or eight of them as they could have issue. And every time there's an issue, the commission come and issue the resolution, uh, trying to charge governments to take actions here and there. So um, this is where we are. 
Um, but also, I, I think that, you know, the question about where we are, we are at the point where, you know, uh, we need now to move forward. So, you know, like Richard said, you know, for almost two years or two and a half years, this has been um, something that uh, the lawyers, the activists, we've done on our own on a voluntary basis. And we are at a point where we need to be able to begin the drafting to agree to develop consensus on those processes is happening up. Um, we are at a point and we are happy for this conversation that we've been invited to, uh, to be able to learn from what others are doing and to figure out you know, how, how we build, how we build together. Because also conscious in our conversation is to make sure that you know, has these different regional processes. I, I've been challenged and, and, and I've been asked, you know, to, to, to provide interpretative processes, you know, for, uh, for the human rights obligations uh, that we ensure that there's coordination at our level. And so in a way that we don't have a situation where, you know, like a friend of mine told me a couple of weeks ago, you know, the inter-American code is in one direction saying these are the obligations the African court is in another direction, see these other obligations. The ICJ is, is saying another thing. The ATLAS is saying another thing. So we figure out how to these are aligned. But also that hopefully we can find a cascading arrangement to make sure that when the decisions come out, there's a reinforcement of that process. So we are hoping, you know, depending who's going to come out first, you know, we don't know, you know, like Richard said, and um, we have our timeline between October and early November to be able to bring this petition before the court to figure out who's going to be the one to come up. But if there's a decision for, from, of, of, of an inter-American process, it gets reinforced by Africa, getting reinforced by the ICJ. So these are the, the areas we are looking at. Uh, there's also the question um, that we are looking at about um, uh, uh, Africa itself has a continent, right? I think uh, to, to just say that our final conclusion is that colleagues have said, you know, even though uh, it's important to look at the different demographics, you know, uh, women, children, indigenous people, but the conclusion from Africa is that all of us on the continent have been impacted by the crisis. And so this petition is actually representing us. And I will stop here um, uh, because I'm sure all of colleagues have things to intervene. There will be more questions for us to contribute more to. But thank you very much for allowing me in uh, our process to, to, to be involved in this very, very rather important conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. That was incredibly fascinating. I think I'm going to do this a little bit differently. I'm going to have us all talk and then we will do a round of questions at the end, if that's OK with everyone. Um, Claudia. Could I ask you to um, to take over at this point? Thank you very much, Dina. Good morning, everyone. First, thank you, Armando, Maria Antonia, and to the whole team at the Sabin Center. It's a pleasure to be here with so many esteemed uh, colleagues. Also good to see Margareta, with whom I uh, sit at the steering committee of the World Commission on Environmental Law, and with whom we've been discussing and exchanging about these issues. Um, I, I wanted to, to start with saying how appropriate the name of this webinar is about a quartet of simultaneous uh, requests, because if there were a time in which judicial diplomacy um, was a, a, a theme, I think it is now. And Alfred, who preceded me, um, talked a little bit about how the courts have different mandates, different jurisdictions, and are going in different um, directions. But I think it's important to keep in mind the baseline and the precedents that um, that we have in a um, in in the advisory opinion twenty three the Inter American Court um, established basically that um, here is everywhere something that happens with regards an infringement of the right to a healthy environment in one country is the infringement of the right to a healthy environment in another um, country. It also established to me a very important um, principle that I think should be um, overarching at least and, and has been in the work of the court in the contentious um, cases, which is that human rights obligations don't occur in a vacuum. They occur in the context of a system of environmental conventionality. So um, having said that, I think that um, these are interesting times that we are uh, living clearly. Um, all the courts have their mandates, they have their, their scope, they have 
um, their jurisdiction. Some are looking at a uh, interpretation of, of of a primary treaty under um, their their mandate, as in the case of the Inter American Court. The purpose of the opinion is the clarification of the scope of state obligations under the American um, conventions in in their um, individual and collective uh, dimension to respond to the climate emergency within that framework. And I think that um, what's interesting, and I see that in the case of um, Africa as well, and in the case of the ITLOS opinion is that the request focuses to some degree on differentiated effects of the climate emergency, in more, in, more so in Africa, on geographic regions, groups in vulnerable situation, children, indigenous people, uh, peasant communities, women. And in the case of the Inter-American Court, even on environmental defenders and their um and their role so i think that we are in a in a unique place right now a lot of work has been done and the questions the way they have been framed they contribute to advance the existing precedent that we have on advisory opinion 23 which focused on um, the effective implementation of MEAs and the role that environmental treaties have with regards to um, human rights so for example and I'm, I'm just uh, picking up on, so, on some of the framing um, questions mind the redundancy that the Dean uh, posed to us for um, for our talk today, but thinking about um, the questions of mitigation, adaptation, um, loss and damage, the, the request to the Inter-American uh, Court, which now and different from uh, before, is very broad. We have six themes and 20 questions. When for advisory opinion 23, there were only five questions. So the scope has widened significantly. But on these issues, the questions are meant to expand what the court has elaborated and has shed light on before. In the case of due diligence, for example, environmental impact assessment, there is a specific question that goes into looking at what is the responsibility of states when it comes to monitoring, uh, regulation, supervision. There's not a specific question about um, corporations, but the way the questions are framed, the answers could be applicable to the role of non-state actors. And in the case of the inter-American system, the court already has set precedent in some cases involving Brazil, for example, involving um, Honduras, with um, uh, enhancing the, the duty that states have to regulate and to supervise uh, non-state actor um, uh, conduct. So I think that, um, again, the, the array is um, incredibly wide. The court could go in many directions, but I think for the, um, for the good of certainty, which is what all uh, stakeholders that look at the court um, to be able to do business, to be able to engage in development uh, actions, what is really necessary is certainty. So um, in that case, the, the parties, and I'm interestingly enough, I'm speaking from Colombia today, the parties that, um, that asked the court, and in the case of Colombia, this is the second request for an advisory uh, opinion on these, um, on these issues. I think we know um, what uh, some of what we can expect. There's more than a handful of contentious cases now using advisory opinion 23 um, as, um, as a foundation or as a basis. The, this advisory opinion has permeated into national court systems. It depends on the country. Some countries like Mexico, for example, give greater standing to their rulings uh, and the decisions of uh, the court through a decision of the um, Supreme Court that, um, and I'm not speaking for the court, by the way, but that establishes that um, all decisions of the inter-American system are binding regardless of whether Mexico is a party um, or, or not our binding precedent. Um, so that's one thing. On the other uh, uh, hand, I think that the countries are um, really looking at guidance for the development of policies, uh, programs, 
um, in, in light of what the court has to say on these uh, six themes that are uh, pretty much focused on um, the differentiated impacts of the climate emergency where science is going to be very relevant because we need to see you know, what happens to those different groups depending to the geographic um, location, depending on the level of vulnerability, intrinsic or extrinsic, and so on. And there's a wide array of treaties that comes together also that the court is being asked to in interpret not explicitly but implicitly because of how the questions are framed and the inter-american system is a library of um a soft law and uh legally binding instruments that um are related for example to risk management uh, in climate change special security concerns of small island states and so on and, and the final thing I want to say about um, the relevance of the um, advisory uh, function of the Inter-American uh, Court and the system is the celerity, because as we have seen in the previous advisory opinion and in other advisory opinions, and I'm not saying for contentious cases, so don't, don't get me wrong here, but in 16 months, we went from having a request from a country to having an advisory opinion and in less than um, a year and a half, a, the first contentious um, case decided, which was the case of Argentina and the Laxauna, um, uh, uh community. So I think a lot to look um, forward. These are interesting times uh, from um, IUCN is working on a written submission to the court upon invitation of the president and based on the work that was done um, before. So looking forward to the exchange. Thank you very much again. Thanks so much, Claudia. Really, really interesting. And I think you raise a kind of range of sort of cross-cutting um, issues and questions that are relevant to all of these applications. Mm -hmm. Margareta, nice to see you. Welcome. Can I hand over to you to talk about um, the ICJ decision? I mean, Absolutely. Thanks so much, um, uh, Dina, and thanks everyone involved in organizing um, this wonderful event. It's so good to be together and to discuss these initiatives because indeed it is very important to have these conversations also uh, amongst those of us who are involved in these initiatives to make sure that uh, they complement and reinforce each other. Um, so I will say a little bit about um, the question, um, because that's what our panel is on. And I'll speak about um, the question posed to the ICJ, but I'll also say a little bit about um, the question that has been posed to, to ITLOS, um, because um, yeah, the, it's important also, I think, to understand how these questions came about and how they relate to one another. So, um, Let's start with the, with the ICJ question. So the ICJ question, of course, um, is a question that is being posed to the ICJ by the UN General Assembly, um, in other words, by all UN member states. And so it has a lot of fingerprints uh, on it. It is a product of very intense negotiations. Um, but, and, and, and in terms of those fingerprints, what is really significant is that um, these are not only the fingerprints of uh, states and their lawyers, but also very much of a global movement and especially the global youth, youth movement. So I think we can identify a core within this question that is a, a climate justice core that has been very much um, informed um, by the global youth movement that um, initially persuaded the government of Vanuatu to pursue this campaign and go all the way through the UNGA, the herring process, to try and um, get this request um, formulated and endorsed by the UNGA. So um, you'll all be familiar with the, with the text of the question as it appears in the resolution that is adopted. And so you'll see that there is, um, the, in terms of the question itself, the operative part of the resolution, there is a relatively long chapeau, which lists a range of sources. 
Um, and it's probably obvious what the purpose is of that chapeau, namely to make sure that the court dwells on these sources and doesn't confine its legal analysis or its answer to the question um, to, for example, the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement. It really looks, at, looks beyond those two treaties, certainly looks at those treaties, but also considers these other sources, including very importantly, um, international human rights treaties. And then specifically listed here are the ICCPR and the ICESCR, which both contain, of course, in Article 1, the right of self-determination, which is a key right when it comes to um, the small island developing states um, and other, um, other states that are particularly affected, but also, of course, indigenous and tribal communities around the world whose uh, means of subsistence are um, being um, undermined or at risk as a result of climate change. So um, these sources are listed in the chapeau and then there are, you can see two, two separate questions. Um, the first question, you can, you can look at it as a kind of two-step approach. So the first question asks the court to stipulate states' obligations on international law and then of course on the resources to ensure the protection of the climate system and other parts of the environment from greenhouse gas emissions for states and for present and future generations. And then a second part of the question asks about the legal consequences under those obligations for states where they, by their acts and omissions, have caused significant harm to the climate system and other parts of the environment. And here again is an, an two sub questions. You can say the first part asking about obligations vis-a-vis -vis states, which are due to their geographical circumstances and level, level of development injured or specifically affected by, or are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. Of course, it's also very coded. All this language is coded, right? So the, we're, we're, we're um, we're seeing implicit or we're seeing traces of the, the law of state responsibility. So the court will be asked to draw to dwell on the law of state responsibility, right? That is where this terminology um, of injured comes from. And then uh, particularly vulnerable is of course um, the, um, language that is derived from the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement, where states that are particularly vulnerable also have particular entitlements under those treaties. Um, and so um, that's the, the first part of that question. And the second part is the pe peoples and individuals of the present and future generations affected by the adverse effects of climate change. And here you see that this comes almost for, uh, verbatim from the question that the Pacific Island uh, stu students fighting climate change and the other youth activists have been um, advocating for as part of their campaign. So that is um, a little bit of the, of the background of this question. Um, and um, well, I'm, I'm very happy to say that, that there have been very intense negotiations at the UNJ, but the core of the question, the climate justice core has been preserved throughout this negotiation process. Um, so um, that's, bodes well for, for our chances of, of securing a helpful answer from the court. And then now let me jump to the, there's of course more to say about this question, but let me quickly jump to uh, the, the other question, the, ITLOS, the, the question posed to ITLOS, just to say a little bit about how this question came about. And that is, um, of course, it's been a very different process, COSIS being an, uh, an intergovernmental organization uh, with a members, membership that is exclusively um, uh, comprised of small island developing states. So um, as, as um, Payam uh, said during the first panel, this means that these states or COSES as an organization has um, full control over um, the process also of formulating the legal question um, no negotiations as such were, were needed. So um, the committee of legal experts 
was tasked with drafting this, this legal question, um, which we have done. And Payam has already explained a little bit the rationale behind choosing this particular focus for this, um, for this request. So it is indeed uh, the logic of, of turning to uh, part 12 of UNCLOS and to focusing again a two a two step uh, or it's not a two step approach exactly but a two pronged um, approach of asking first um, uh, for for um, clarification of obligations to prevent reduce and control pollution of the marine environment and a second to protect and preserve the marine environment in relation to, in relation to climate change impacts including ocean warming and sea level rise and ocean acidification. Um, and so um, clearly there is overlap between these questions. So um, both questions concern the obligations of states on the international law um, to address climate impacts and particularly greenhouse gas emissions or impact resulting from emissions. And they reference both, both questions reference uh, key instruments and principles, the, the UNFCCC, um, the Paris Agreement, and UNCLOS are specifically referenced in um, in these questions, in both questions, and also emphasize uh, the potential harm to vulnerable groups and the environment caused by climate change. Um, there's of course um, a slight um, difference in the um, in this in scope and emphasis. It goes without saying that UNCLOS is a specialized tribunal, and whereas um, the ICJ is a court of general jurisdiction. So the, the question posed to uh, ITLOS, uh, ITLOS, I, was, I meant to say, the question posed to ITLOS is, um, is tailored to its specific mandate, whereas the, the question posed to the ICJ is more broadly formulated to really benefit from the, from the court's unique position to provide um, clarification of international law um, more broadly, taking into account all these different bodies of, of, um, of, um, of norms and really providing states with guidance on what an integrative approach to these different bodies of law um, looks like. And so both, uh, both questions address mitigation focusing on the obligations of states to protect the climate system uh, and other parts of the environment. Um, the it loss question also, you can say, uh, contains an, an adaptation dimension because uh, obligations to prevent, reduce and control pollution of the marine environment also have an, an adaptation um, component. Um, oh, sorry, the protect and preserve the marine environment have an adaptation component. Um, and the ICJ, the question to the ICJ, of course, also touches on loss and damage, not explicitly because it doesn't use the terminology of the Paris Agreement, but it asks about the legal consequences uh, of states' acts and omissions, and so actually um, address this question head on, but in, in a different language, in the language of the law state responsibility. Um, and then, um, Dina, just um, a, a question to you as the, as the chair. Um, should I um, should I say more about the questions that you provided us uh, with in advance of the webinar, or should I <laughs> pause here and then hand back to you and, uh, and and talk to these points as part of the dialogue? maybe um maybe let's do that let's let's have a little bit of a conversation because i think um one of the things that's coming through kind of very interestingly is is the kind of commonalities but also maybe some of the strategic differences um that have that have kind of manifested in each of these cases um so may, so i think maybe it's a good moment to pause if that's okay margaret and we can hear a little bit more about it last from amanda and then we can come back and talk about all of this together that suits everyone. Amanda, first of all, thank you very much, Margareta. Amanda, over to you. Thank you very much, Dean, and thank you very much for the other panelists. You have said something, many things, many very important to my topic specifically, so I will refer back to you at some instances. So thank you very much for making my life much better. And 
if you allow me, I will be very selfish. And I, instead of guiding you through the, the questions uh, posed before the eat law, since Margarita, for instance, has done this very eloquently, I will be selfish and I will select the points, the five points I would like the, the eat laws to have in mind for questions and one final institutional point. Before that, I will just be very brief in terms of you know, the introduction by saying that uh, the question being posed to the eat laws does not come as, as a surprise because the interaction between climate change and the oceans are is very well known and identified in scientific literature. We just have to think about ocean acidification, for instance, sea level rise or geoengineering. And I have picked up these three examples because they show us how the oceans are victims, how they are aggressors because of climate change, but also how they are um, part of the solution at the same time. Now, the problem is that being the UN clause adopted in the 1980s, quite before the UNFCCC, there is uh, no word throughout its provisions, its wording regarding this connection between oceans and climate change. So one technically difficulty that ETLOS has to deal with is what state's obligations can be derived, unveiled, or implied from the wording of the UN clause regarding the protection, the preservation, and very importantly, the regeneration of the oceans in this context of the climate crisis. Now, one option we all know about is to try cross-regime interaction, which is actually mandatory according to Article 300. 11 of the UN clause and also under Article 31st, Paragraph 3 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties. And this will for sure be tested by the EAT laws because cross-regime interaction, it reinforces values and obligations. It shows that a specific concern for the international community is not uh, reserved for a specialized treaty, but rather something communal to the international society in general. And in this specific case, we know that there are more states parties to the UNFCC and the Paris Agreement and to the UN clause, although both are quite universal. And if I'm not wrong, all states parties to the UN clause are also parties to the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement. This could be a good news, but if the obligations under the UNFCCC and under the Paris Agreement are very short, what can we gain from this? And specifically, if the modus operandi of the Paris Agreement is to rely on states' self-differentiation, how will the UN clause identify um, undifferentiated, unified, one-size-fits-all obligations binding upon all states? So I'm sure that cross-regime -re interaction will be important, but I don't think it's a silver bullet. And in the end, the eat laws will have to look to the UN clause itself. And fortunately, although the UN clause does not mention climate change at all, we also know that not all treaties are end games. In the sense that treaties like the UN clause, which provide a framework of governance for the oceans, they are, and the UNCLOS itself is a living instrument, which needs to be responsive to current and future needs and challenges. And therefore, it cannot provide um, a, an answer to a problem like climate change and the oceans, which is out of touch with reality. So maybe the point for the heat loss is to discover something that already exists implied in the UN clause itself. And fortunately, as Margarita said before, the questions, the two questions posed to the EAT laws, they don't try to link the UN clause and the UNFCCC. They rather try to establish what obligations can actually and already be identified under the UN clause itself. Now, more good news. Part 12 of the UN clause, which deals with protection and preservation of the marine environment, establishes a framework for future state action in this field. And to that end, 
it first relies on a typology of sources of pollution, which includes land-based activities, seabed activities, vessel source pollution. So it actually covers all of the activities which are greenhouse gas emitting. So this is a good point, a good baseline to, to start from. Second, there is a notion definition of pollution, which is included in Article 1st, Paragraph 1.4, which is a very broad notion, which can easily include greenhouse gas emissions. It can also include the impact of climate change. Sea level rise can be seen also as pollution for these purposes, the loss of biodiversity. This has been already mentioned by specifically by the arbitral tribunal in the South China Sea case. And one thing very interesting for me, and this has not been tested yet, is the fact that the, the UN closing notion of pollution, it refers to the introduction of substances and energy. And in fact, the drafters, they, they had in, what they had in mind was radioactive sources, but it itself is energy. And extreme weather events, such as hurricanes, they are created by the excess of energy accumulating in the oceans. So this can also be included in this definition of pollution under the UN clause. So the baseline will for sure be Article 192, which establishes that states have the duty to protect and preserve the marine environment, followed by Article 194, which expressly requires states to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment from any source, and then the more specific provisions throughout Part 12 of the, the UN clause. Now, the two questions that were asked to the court, as Margarita mentioned before, are first, what are states' obligations to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment caused by anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions? And the second question refers to states' obligations to protect and preserve the marine environment from climate change impacts itself. So this includes mitigation and adaptation efforts, for sure. It includes also some modality of resilience building. And if we are creative enough, we can include in the question also geoengineering and loss and damage, which I think the ETLOS will be afraid if this is not expressly question, probably the judges will avoid it, especially because uh, to answer to that, the, the ethos would have to track um, damages not only to states, but also to common goods such as the atmosphere first, the ICs, and the area. So this would be very much of a complex issue to deal with. Now, I promised just five topics. So the first one refers to um, the possible existence of a minimum content, a minimum threshold of the, the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. Because in this framework perspective of part 12, basically what it provides for are procedural obligations and namely due diligence obligations. But could we say that despite the margin of discretion granted to states, there is a minimum threshold that states need to guarantee. So in the sense that if they don't meet at least that bare minimum, they are already infringing the UN clause. I understand that we tend to look to part 12 of the UN clause as having just obligations of results and not, uh, I'm sorry, obligations of means and not obligations of results. But this distinction is very artificial and we can have several shades of gray in between, especially because obligations of means, they are only meaningful if they are purpose oriented. We only have those obligations of conduct if we want to achieve a certain result. So if states are not even achieving the minimum we want, can't we say that they are already infringing a substantive obligation under the UN clause even if that is not expressly mentioned in Article 192 or throughout that, the Part 12 of the, um, of the UN clause. Of course, this would again raise a problem of shared responsibility, but even if only symbol symbolically, it would be important for the ethos to touch on this point. Second, it will need necessarily to look to due diligence and to standards. 
And this has been pointed out before by Richard, if I'm not wrong, but by someone that, that I remember at least, that these procedural obligations, they lack teeth. They have been, uh, the details has been quite eager to say that all states have the duty to conduct environmental impact assessments, that there is a very stringent duty of cooperation. But in the end, the e as the ICJ has been basically unable to provide teeth or to provide flesh out what is the bare minimum content of these procedural obligations. And the main, one of the main problems for me is the fact that in state practice, we still look to this idea of um, obligation of environmental impact assessment as being limited to activities undertaken at sea. But we know that at least 80% of all marine pollution comes from land-based activities and greenhouse gas gases. The percentage is even higher than that. So it would be very important for the, the ETLOS to flesh out these more procedural obligations and to explain us what are the substantive requirements implicit to due diligence procedural obligations. I know that we don't have that many, uh, as a basis, we don't have any judgments or arbitral words on this regard, but scholarship has evolved. And if you think about the works of Samantha Besson, Alicia Albino, they have already provided a safe ground for these developments in the law of the sea. Third question refers to something I would like the ITLOS to speak about, refers to this idea of states parties, because the question refers to states parties obligations under the Dune clause, but it does not mention what states or what quality of states, which means that in my view, the ITLOS needs to address the full range of states. So coastal states are the most obvious, but landlocked states, they also have obligations to protect oceans from gas, greenhouse gases emitted from land-based activities. The same way that flag and port states, they must have very stringent obligations. So what we need to deal with here, and I would like to, to see the ITLOs touching on these points, are the obligations of port states and to a bigger extent of flag states with respect to um, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So remember that one of the most damaging activities to the atmosphere is the sh shipping industry. And we still accept, to say the least, that states of flag states of convenience are uh, to be accepted, that there is no um, substantive meaning of what is a genuine link under Article 94 of the UN clause, which actually explains why most of the vessels is very old and does not follow state-of-the-art requirements in terms of um, reducing emissions of greenhouse gases from vessels. So it would be important to have ECOS saying something more and reversing its case law on the genuine link and flag states obligations. And I would love to see the ETLOS quoting the last week's, if I'm not wrong, directive of the European Union on shipping standards, also the IMO convention and annex six, but mostly I would love to see it quoting what European Union has done in terms of providing extraterritorial obligations in complying with shipping uh, standards. Fourth point, considerations of humanity, which I know is very far-fetched. But the it laws has said in prompt release cases that when states employ force, they must comply with human rights standards. But in fact, what the ETLO said was that when states employ force in the sense of prescriptive and enforcement measures, they must have in mind what is the downstream human rights impact. Now, this is a very, very, very long shot, but it would be curious to see if the ETLO accepts that by damaging the atmosphere and ergo damaging the oceans and ergo damaging human rights, if states are not infringing these human rights standards, which are included inside the UN clause under this idea of considerations of humanity. Now, I understand this is really a very long shot, but perhaps if the intervenience in these proceedings, if the amicus courier bring this issue, at least the eight laws will be forced to explain if we have or not here an infringement 
of um, human rights standards, and especially of vulnerable groups. So I will refer back to Alfred. He was very emotional, intimate, and very insightful in explaining how some countries and some communities are more, more vulnerable, such as low-lying countries, developing countries. It's far-fetched, but we can say that by emitting greenhouse gas in this manner and damaging the ocean in this way, perhaps states are infringing considerations of humanity obligations. And finally, my last point refers to how to be influential, which is something that was also very eloquently touched by Payam Akavani. I hope I did not mispronounce his name. And this is very important for me because the EPLOS is a kind of a failed project in the sense that it has not been able yet to affirm itself as the authoritative dispute settlement body in the law of the sea. In this case, the EGLOS cannot risk being sidelined. It cannot be risk being perceived as less authoritative, and it cannot risk rendering an, an opinion no one reads and no one could care less about. So perhaps being bold would be important in the sense that if the ethos is very bold with respect to considerations of humanity, perhaps that could be important for the Inter-American Court of Human Rights or the European Court or the African Court of Human Rights. And if the ethos is bold in determining how unified our state's obligations under climate change um, in this interaction between the ocean and climate change, perhaps it could be influential for future ICJ opinion being rendered. Now, again, if participants bring the same line of arguments and the same line of reasoning before the ICJ, the ETLOS, and the Inter-American African Courts, perhaps this will enable this more authoritative influence of the ETLOS. I think I have already spoken too much, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amanda. Really interesting. We are kind of close to out of time, but I wonder if I could um, have you all briefly um, reflect what you've already done, actually, all spoken to, to the questions I asked. But one of the things that's really, I think, come through in all of your talks, um, and and I asked you to sort of think about commonality between these um, applications, and, and I also asked you to think about vulnerability in relation to all of these applications. And it seems to me that vulnerability although understood perhaps in different ways, coming from different places is a kind of key commonality here. So at least some of these have been initiated um, by vulnerable countries, by um, vulnerable communities. Alfred talked a lot about kind of the importance of really a grassroots um, application in Africa. But, and I wondered if I could have each of you talk a little bit about that and talk about whether you think we'll kind of hear anything from the courts on that issue, given the way that the questions have been phrased. But I wondered if you could also maybe, and this last comment that Armando made has really made me think about this, but I also think it's important in relation to the other courts in the African court, the vulnerability of courts in these situations and whether there is um, the risk that Armando points to of kind of being sidelined in the case of maybe ITLAS, maybe in the case of the African court, perhaps not internationally, but amongst its own members. Um, but but the, the kind of vulnerability of putting themselves in such a sort of politically compromising, difficult questioning position. I know that's not a question I sent to you before we started. I'm just springing it on you. But if you have any thoughts, um, that would be great. Alfred, do you want to start? Oh, absolutely. Um, thank you very much. And I'm happy you um, you brought that issue up about um, we, 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 and, and we're talking about the vulnerabilities of the frontline communities and the defenders, the activists, the, uh, uh, the indigenous people who are involved. But also much more, I think, profoundly that you show out is the issue of potential vulnerabilities of the court Right in terms of, of how 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 they will move on something like this, um, you know, as we all know, where the struggle is, and even with the different respective uh, climate litigation across the world, uh, we're definitely seeing how, interestingly, a number of courts have said 
you know, this is an issue for the political office of a state to respond to the legislature. They should do something like this. These questions shouldn't be coming to the court, you know, from the US, in Europe, in Africa, in other areas where these cases have come, more or how that process is. And so I think really um, um, a number of the strategy that I think we should adapt is, is, you know, maybe it's time to begin some sort of outreach Right. I know, for example, um, my colleague Richard shared with me an information that uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, the African Commission and the Inter-American Commission had a sort of um, um, an engagement, and I think by the University of Pretoria. Um, and I think this is very, very important. You know, it's important that uh, this court, the African court, the European court, the Inter-American Court, and maybe even others, you know, they could figure out among themselves to start to start having some internal conversation, internal engagement, open up for for outreach and you know some sort of campaigning. So maybe this is be very important to see how that really is. And um, and for us, you know, across the continent, um, you know, um, you know, in 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 our quest, um, we are specifically relying on the African Charter. And I think uh, the uh, the African Charter, you know, is is extremely progressive um, as compared to others, um, you know, in terms of what this is about. Um, and then we are also looking at um, a number of the different areas within the Charter that we believe um, um, could respond to and could address, you know, uh, 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 those vulnerabilities. You know, for example, I talked earlier on about, you know, the right to life. Right in the African Charter, that's Article Four. Um, the right to freedom of movement, you know, um, that's Article Twelve. Um, the right to health, the right to self determination, the right to economic, social, and cultural right. But I think uh, much more importantly, you know, Article Twenty One uh, in the African Charter, which talk about in the case of spoliation that the dispossessed people shall have the right to law for the recovery of property and adequate compensation. You know, what we see just a vulnerability, I think Article 20 uh, or 21 of the African Charter is very, very, very instructive here because it demands that indigenous people con have control over their land and they are adequately compensated for losses that they suffer. And this is what we see. And I think, uh, you know, trying to link that, um, you know, to, uh, to what Amanu, uh, Amanu was talking about in terms of the vulnerability linked to the laws of the state convention, both with respect, with respect to flag state and post state uh, responsibilities and the vulnerability that come along with that could be, um, or how that is aligned because a, a, a number of indigenous people are also very much coastal communities. A number of indigenous people are also very much folks who live across different islands that have implication for the climate crisis. Um, whether you know the rise of uh, of uh, uh, of sea level, but even much more the issue, and sometimes we, we we don't talk about it. River systems, the diversion of of courses of river systems and their implications. So most times, folks talk about well, you know, sea level rise. Well, what happened to river systems that indigenous people live around and depend on the implication and that vulnerability? And I think the African Charter draw a lot of attention to that. And I think for us, what is also very important is how maybe uh, the African Commission, you know, like we know it's a difference between the commission and the court, right? You know, so, and, and how it has provided a number of different mandates, you know, um, 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 to different states in terms of what the obligation is. I think, like I said, there were more than 15 or 20. And specifically speaking, to the question of vulnerability, there's actually a resolution that speaks to the question of vulnerability that's talk about what state obligations are and what they need to do. And so we are hoping that in terms of the interpretation of the code that they will be able to, 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 to clearly address that. But also I think uh, for, for, the, for the African code, um, um, there's an obligation that it takes cognizance of, um, of, of international law. And so, for example, um, we are hoping, and, and, and we've seen that in a number of African uh, court law jurisprudence, where it has drawn upon the inter-American system, where it's drawn upon the, 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 the European court, and where it's also drawn upon the international uh, uh, court of justice. So 
I believe that uh, 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 in terms of the alignment uh, 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 and, and how we framed it and how those of us who are involved behind the scene in working on this issue and, and framing this uh, 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 discussion who work to ensure that these different codes are taken cognizant. So if we, if we figure out a part of our strategy is trying to get in this court, even as we are framing these questions and we are engaging them, that they begin to talk among themselves, I think we are also getting there. But there's something else I want, I, 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 I want to also bring up here. Um, across the continent, this is a citizens driven process. I think there's a clear distinction here. It is civil society, it's the activists, it's the public frontline lawyers who are working to try to advance this sort of work um, to, to, to drive this. This is unlike what happened in the American system, even though I know, you know, um, and Claudia will see this, you know, that the, 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 the conceptualization of this was a civil society process, and you, and, and you folks went ahead and tried to figure out, uh, you know, to figure out you know, which governments, you know, could, could become allies to drive this. Um, has compared to that. And, and also, you know, um, with Vanuatu, um, we all know the history of this is that the young people got together and started a conversation and then the government picked this up. So in all of these things, centered behind that is the driving force for civil society, how to find a way to structure this. So I think uh, the vulnerabilities along that, that constellation of, or, or that pendulum figuring out, you know, whether it's linked to the oceans, it's linked to the sort of regional context, uh, could be very, very key for how we are advancing this. But one thing that I think uh, I want to draw up here that I, 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 I believe um, um, could be extremely helpful uh, would be that uh, as we are sharing, I think sharing, sharing draft, sharing strategy, um, uh, engaging in this process, hopefully this is not the, the, the first and the last conversation we are having, that the more we talk about this, um, and then also engagement, because if you look at how these things are existing, it is very clear to us that uh, in the room, the elephant in the room would be the ICJ, right? Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm saying that because, I mean, it is clear if you just went back and look at the, your data analysis of the jurisprudence, it is the most conservative. And I mean, well, yes, because, you know, it's, it's government judges sitting there, right? But I think uh, a targeted campaign by a lot of us, you know, in a matter of trying to get this court to talk, you know, like, you know, you know, when this issue come up in the Hague and really trying to draw the vulnerability, making sure that in the folks from Iron states who are the most vulnerable, who knows that in a couple of years, they may not even have a state anymore. Indigenous people, you know, from Africa, from South Asia, from Asia itself, from the South Pacific, from, 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 from Central America, that you know, hopefully we can descend on the Hague. So the Hague is very much aware that these things are coming about and that they can be able to definitely see what the vulnerability looks like. So I will start because I'm sure others want, I don't want to, to overdo Thank it. Thank so. you. Thanks, uh, Alfred. That was incredibly interesting. We are, <laughs> we have eaten into the break um, and I think everyone probably needs a little break to grab a cup of tea or um, pop to the bathroom. But there've been lots of really interesting questions from, um, from the attendees. If you have a look at the q and I'm, I'm sorry there wasn't more time for this fascinating conversation. Thank you very much to all of our panelists for your really interesting um, discussions of each of these applications and the way they intersect with each other. If I could ask you to please have a look at the Q&A and have a look at some of those questions and maybe type some answers to them as you go. Um, to the attendees, you can see that that's what's been happening already. There's been some back and forth in the Q&A, so I'd encourage that to carry on. Thank you again. We are going to take a six minute break. I'm sorry, that's a little shorter than we originally thought that would be, but I think it's been absolutely worth it. Um, and we will be back here um, on the hour um, for our third panel. Thank you, everyone.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, I'd like to ask our uh, speakers for the third panel to turn on their videos. We can spotlight you. Um, it's been a really incredible discussion so far. Finished this off on the, on the third one. Um, so we are going to have Rosemary Roland Holst, who is an assistant professor in international environmental law at Durham University. Uh, her research focuses on contemporary challenges at the intersection of international law of the seas, climate change law, and global environmental law. And she's a member of the team assisting COSIS in drafting the submissions for the Italy's advisory opinion. Then we have Yusra Swedi, who is a, a fellow in law at uh, LSE Law School, where she teaches public international law. Her research in, is on public interest in international dispute settlement, including international climate litigation. And uh, she has trained at the University of Geneva and worked with the United Nations, the International Court of Justice, and the International Law Commission. Um, then we have Julia Sherman, who is an associate in the Washington, D.C. Office of Three Crowns, LLP, where she specializes in public international law and investment treaty disputes. And she was also a judicial fellow to Judge Joan E. Donahue at the International Court of Justice. And finally, Rodrigo da Costa Salles from Open Society Justice Initiative, uh, who's a Brazilian lawyer. Uh, he has an LLM in International Human Rights Law from the University of Notre Dame. Um, and focuses now on preparing written arguments on climate change and human rights for an advisory opinion um, on the topic of, of climate change. Rodrigo has also worked as a researcher on the situation on environmental defenders in Latin America and um, at the Inter-American Association for the Defense of the Environment. And his responsibilities at AIDA included litigating cases in the, in the inter-American system and um, and has also, he has also worked as a clerk at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So we have a, a, a really incredible set of speakers to join us on this third panel, which focuses on what happens now that these um, advisory opinions are in progress or uh, you know, in the case of the African one, sort of what the process is moving forward once that uh, is eventually filed. So uh, Rosemary, can we start with you? Well, thanks very much, Maria Antonia. Um, I hope everyone can hear me uh, properly. Um, and thanks to all the organizers for the invitation to join this very timely discussion, which I've been enjoying very much um, so far in the previous two panels. Um, I think I'll stick to the brief and um, say a few things about the sort of procedural timeline and the next steps that we are working on and that we can expect uh, in the it loss process. And then maybe we can leave some broader reflections, hopes, uh, and, and points of anticipation for the, for the Q&A discussion. So as Professor Akavan sketched out in the first panel, it loss is the process of the furthest along sort of in the procedural timeline. So the deadline for written submissions is this June, 16th of June. And that's of course the opportunity for COSIS to submit their written submissions, but also all states parties to the ONCLOS are invited. Um, as well as any international organizations that the tribunal invites that are, according to the rules, able to furnish information on the question uh, and examples of uh, international organizations that have been invited to do so include obviously the UNFCCC, UNAP, but also the IMO, the FAO, uh, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, um, the World Meteorological organization uh, and the IUCN as well, um, of course, in including important organizations that can also provide input on the on the data and then the science side of things. Um, interestingly, not officially provided for in the rules of ITLOS are uh, amicus briefs, but ITLOS has a practice of actually um, allowing amicus briefs from NGOs and putting them up on the website. So they're not officially part of the case file, but they're nevertheless given that sort of visibility. Um, and in the two previous advisory opinions that we have from it lost, that opportunity has been used, for example, by the WWF. And I think in this case, and on this topic of climate change, we can probably expect uh, a wider interest from a wider range of NGOs 
to make use of that opportunity. So after this deadline in June, we will know the sort of collection of, of inputs that we have. Again, drawing on the sort of one precedent that we have for an advisory opinion from the full tribunal, that was the one requested by the Sub-Regional Fisheries Committee a few years ago, that procedural tool was quite, um, quite well used. So that in that case, we had about 22 states and the EU making written submissions and about seven international organizations. And again, I think in this case, climate change and even broader uh, topic of broader interest, potentially, I think we can expect um, a diverse set of, of submissions. And those who submit written submissions will also be invited by the tribunal uh, to present those at the oral hearings. Um, so depending on whether after June, the tribunal may fix a deadline for a second round of written submissions or not, quite soon we can probably uh, expect a day to be fixed for those oral hearings, which is Professor Akavan stressed, might well be already after the summer or in the course of autumn. And it also has a decent track record of proceeding relatively quickly. So we might expect um, an actual advisory opinion in the first half of 2024. Um, perhaps I'll leave it at that and, and sort of take it on the basis of questions from here on. Does that sound, sound good? It sounds good. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, so let's move on to uh, Yusra now. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the process? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much for having me um, on this panel and in this webinar. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to all of the other speakers in the previous panels, and I'm happy to kind of provide my two cents on the um, on the African system um, to kind of build on what uh, Richard and Alfred have um, have already said. So, because we are fairly um, uh, you know, we're in the very early stages um, with respect to the um, African court. I think um, it's pretty important to say something about actually filing the request, just because that in the context of the African court is particularly tricky and controversial. So to give some context, um, there have been about 15 requests for advisory opinions in the court's history, which is not that much, but 11 of those have actually been filed by NGOs. Um, and there have been a lot of rejections because the court has only ever um, given four advisory opinions. So it's really important to get it right in terms of you know, who is gonna file this request and to really make sure that all of the conditions are respected because um, that has been a common source or reason for um, many um, excellent and promising requests being rejected. Um, so the, the trickiness with that is that um, you have to be a rec you have to be an African organization recognized by the African Union. Um, and there is some jurisprudence that tells us a little bit more about what that means. Um, but essentially, it's not enough to have an observer status with the African Union. And that's a very common misconception that that's enough. But in 2017, there were four advisory uh, requests that were rejected for that reason, because they felt like it was enough to just be an observer with the African Union, and that's not enough. You actually have to be recognized by the African Union, which involves kind of a separate process. And the Executive Council of the African Union has adopted some criteria, which is honestly buried in the dark depths of the internet and very difficult to find, <laughs> but I'm happy to circulate it. Um, and there are um, a series of conditions that have to be met. So that I would say is one very critical part um, of the kind of the, the process moving forward. And then the second thing I'd say is just to contextualize um, the, 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 the prospect of having an advisory opinion, as I've said, only 15 have been ever kind of requested, four have been given, none on environmental issues. So there was one which was struck out, which had potential to be related to the environment. There were some environmental matters related to some mining rights um, and mining activities, but that was struck out. So this, you know, if it, it were to go through, and I'm sure that it will, will be 
really significant in terms of just in the context of the practice of advisory opinions um, in the African system. Um, in terms of opportunities for third party intervention, um, there's a lot more promise uh, in the sense that I think that the African court is actually quite receptive to, for example, amicus curiae briefs um, from a procedural perspective. So in quite a, I would say maybe five to six cases, um, advisory proceedings, it has authorized intervention by intergovernmental or NGOs who are active in the areas addressed by the request. There has been maybe one rejection, but overall, um, I think that assuming that in this case there would be a lot, and I'm sure that there would be a lot of kind of movement towards um, civil society participation to intervene, um, I don't see that being uh, rejected by the court, especially for such um, for such an important question. Um, what's interesting to note is that the NGOs actually rarely intervene as amici curiae, even though um, you know it, it 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 doesn't really seem to be a problem for the court. But I hope that in this situation, um, you know, it'll be uh, a bit of a different turn for the practice um, of the African court. And um, in terms of the timeline moving forward, um, I am going to optimistically uh, refer to one of the last advisory opinions that the court came out with, which was on pandemics and elections during the pandemics. And that was filed in June 2020, and a decision came out in July 2021. So literally from start to finish, one year. I think a reason for that is because the authors of that advisory um, request, they, they asked for expedited consideration of the request. So you can do that to kind of accelerate the process. And the court has explained that in another one of its advisory opinions um, also came out in 2021. So I think that if that were to be done and given the importance of the issue, um, I, I, I'm actually fairly optimistic that it could be quite quick um, if, you know, when it kind of gets through the door, um, which is a, a really exciting prospect. Um, perhaps I'll stop here and I'll just allow for um, further discussion later on. Thanks so much. That's great. Thank you so much. It's really, really helpful to understand some of these requirements for filing that as well, since it's such a different, you know, it's in, it's in, it's in such a different stage than the other ones. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so let's move on to Rodrigo now, if you can tell us a little bit about the Inter-American Court. Sure, Maria, and thank you very much for, for organizing this webinar. Um, very happy to be sharing this space with my fellow panelists. So I actually prepared a um, PowerPoint presentation with, with a timeline. Um, so I try yeah. to share my screen here, um, but I'm having a hard time trying to share my screen. Um, to say I can just... Um, Yeah, I don't know why I can't. Well, that's unfortunate. You want to send it to me? I can. I can. Uh, okay. So maybe the other person can speak, Maria, if that's the case, and then oh, move over to to Julia. If that's okay. Yeah. No problem. Um. Well. Um, thank you very much, Maria, for having me and to the other organizers of the Saving Center. I'm going to keep um the topic of the nitty gritty of the procedural next steps. And so, as you've heard from the other speakers today, some of whom were actually involved in the request, the UN General Assembly resolution requesting an advisory opinion from the ICJ was passed on March 29th. That resolution was formally received by the court on April 17th, and then just this week on April 20th, the court issued its first order in respect of the case in which it fixed the time limits for written proceedings. Now, in most cases, it's not a particularly exciting step, but because we have so many um, parallel proceedings happening, this is quite interesting because it gives some initial insight into how long the court thinks that these proceedings will take. And just to take a step back, I should say that Article 66, um, Paragraph 2 of the ICJ statute empowers any state entitled to be appear before the court or international organization considered by the court as likely to be able to furnish information on the question posed in the request to participate in the proceedings. So this is quite similar to it loss. 
And by international organizations, I mean treaty-based organizations whose members are states. In the past, we've seen participation from the African Union, um, League of Arab States, um, in ICJ advisory opinions. So this isn't as expansive as the African Court of Human and People's Rights and not as expansive as the Inter-American Court, as you've heard today. Um, so in its April 20th order, the court has given states six months to submit a first written statement and then a further three months to submit written comments. And in that order, it also identified the United Nations as an international organization that is likely to be able to furnish information on the questions posed in that request. That's not unsurprising. The court usually invites the organization that um, requested the advisory opinion to participate. This doesn't mean that other international organizations might request to participate later on. We saw um, it, most recently in the parallel, or most recently in the Chagos advisory opinion, we saw the African Union seek to participate um, a few months into the proceedings. And so also just to compare to Chagos, which is the most recently concluded advisory opinion proceedings, their states had six and a half months to submit written statements and a further two and a half months to submit written comments. And as for oral proceedings in Chagos, the court scheduled a very tight four days of hearings in September, 2018, which was a total of 14 months after the request had been formally received by the court. And then finally, the court rendered its advisory opinion in late February, 2019. So that was a total of 20 months following the receipt of the request in June, 2017. And so if we're assuming that the court is trying to follow a similar procedural timeline for the climate change advisory opinion now before it, that would mean that we could expect a hearing potentially in May or June 2024, so 14 months for the receipt of the request in April. And then an advisory opinion could potentially be rendered in mid-December 2024. That said, I think there's a, a number of reasons why this timeline might be rather optimistic. Um, in the first place, the court will need to receive or likely will want to receive the dossier from the UN Secretariat well before it receives written statements from states and international organizations. And the dossier is a collection of all documents considered by the UN Secretariat to be relevant to the requested advisory opinion. And it's explicitly requested in the ICJ statute, Article 65. And in Chagos, the dossier was comprised of 473 documents. I think it's fairly reasonable to expect that the climate change dossier will be even more extensive. And I'm sure the UN Secretariat is seriously preparing it as we speak. And because it will probably take more time to prepare, it's possible that that first um, that first deadline for the written statements might get pushed out. This is just me speculating. I have no idea. Um, and then second, I think it's also reasonable to expect that even more states will participate in the climate change advisory opinion than in Chagos. In Chagos, there were 38 states and the African Union, which participated between the written and oral proceedings, some in both, some in just one. Um, now, the fact that the court has scheduled the first round of written statements to be submitted in just six months and then written comments just three months thereafter suggests that they're very motivated to get these proceedings going. But the reality is that the court has a very heavy caseload at the moment. Um, I think there's 17 cases in the queue. And that includes another advisory opinion ahead of it. The court is also extremely limited in its manpower um, with say between 60 lawyers working there between the court and the registry. And I'm including the judges in that number. And while the individuals who work there are phenomenally talented and hardworking, I imagine it will take some time for everyone to get across the deluge of paper that is coming their way. And I wouldn't be, and so I wouldn't be surprised if the court takes a bit more time for itself between the close of written proceedings and a hearing than it did in Chagos and other advisory opinions. And similarly, more time between a hearing and rendering the advisory opinion than it was the case in Chagos and some other recent. Again, we also can't rule out the possibility that states or an international organization may ask for more time in their written submissions, pushing out the uh, pushing out the deadlines. And I also think that the court might take or schedule one or more weeks for oral proceedings um, in the case, which is how the court handled the nuclear weapons advisory opinion, where there were 22 states. Chagos proceeded much more quickly, but we know there's such a level of interest in this case, not that there wasn't in, in Chagos, but there's such a high international level of interest among civil society um, and the international community that they might want to give a bit more airtime to each state or international organization than, than was allocated in Chagos. And then finally, I think that we shouldn't rule out the possibility that the court might try to schedule its proceedings around the other parallel advisory opinion proceedings, as Professor Akaban and some other 
panelists had mentioned earlier today, there's a good likelihood that one or more advisory opinion will be rendered before um, the ICJ gets going. And particularly it loss, as uh, Rosemary said, might be rendered in early 2024. So potentially before the second round of written submissions is due in ICJ. And I don't want to um, jump ahead for Rodrigo's uh, presentation, but proceedings before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights have typically taken much longer than um, other courts, particularly because of the involvement of individual civil society and NGOs, which is a, not the case before the ICJ in terms of its formal rules. And so because of this, and also because of the ICJ's comparatively broader jurisdiction, and maybe also because it's comparatively more conservative approach, as other panelists have mentioned, it might try to schedule itself in a way that it renders its advisory opinion last. Um, so generally speaking, ICJ proceedings usually take between 10 and 24 months. I think because of these factors um, that I mentioned, the court's opinion will likely come at the outer end of that range around the 24 mark optimistically, which would put us in April 2025. At the same time, we have to keep in mind that the court will be conscious of the exceptionally high level of interest in this case, as well as the real world urgency of the opinion that prompted youth activists to seek it in the first place. There is a provision in the ICJ rules that allows for the court to allocate its resources and scheduling in a way um, to expedite um, rendering an advisory opinion. This is Article 103 of the rules. So far, that hasn't been invoked, but it could be at some point. Either way, there's a lot of work and a lot of reading that will be happening between then and now, and I'm sure that everybody's waiting to see uh, what happens. So I'll end there and I'll turn it over to Rodrigo. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, and I can share Rodrigo's slides now. And we can... right. can, you, can you see it now? Yes. Uh, Maria, can you just uh, you can, oh, you're doing it. okay, perfect. So I, I prepared this um, PowerPoint presentation for you to have some sort of visual representation of the procedure at the Inter-American Court. Um, so I think that you can see Maria. I think that's some some sort of pop up in the so oh. yeah. So. Okay. Yes, now. So now you can see. So I, I know that this panel is about the future and what will happen, hopefully, but I will need to go back to the past a little bit just to talk what will happen next. And um, so as Ambassador uh, Lucia Solano was speaking, the process um, at the Inter-American system is very easy and it's not complex at all and it's very flexible as, we, as you will see throughout the presentation. Um, so I will go back to the past, but not that much, um, just March, um, when the court is one of the first steps, not the first one, um, invited the invited states um, through the OAS. So the first thing that the court will do is um, send uh, the, the request to main OAS bodies and its member states to ensure that they are aware of the process and they will participate. But at the same time, or almost at the same time, um, the court also invites um, all interested parties to participate in this process. And this is very interesting because when they say all interested parties, it's actually whoever wants to participate in the process. Um, so the state actors from the OAS will participate through the, the, the invitation that they do through the OAS. Let's call it play this way. Um, but then all interested parties can participate as well. Um, so this allows individuals, scholars, um, universities, um, civil society organizations to fully participate in the, in the process. And um, even corporations, if they want to do, and they think that this is very important because we are talking about climate justice um, issues, so even corporations could participate, and we know that they are actually working um, on intervention. Some um, some corporations are, are working on uh, intervention before the Inter-American Court for this advisory opinion. And uh, we, as Justice Initiative, we have been in touch with many organizations, and we can see that there will be 
a lot of organizations, human rights organizations, environmental organizations, and even scientific organizations as well, um, participating in the board, making sure that the board will receive um, the information that they need uh, for this advisory opinion. And this is very interesting as well, because then the court will not only receive legal arguments, which is actually what happens when there is a judicial procedure, that the court will more likely receive um, legal arguments. Of course, other people will join as experts um, selected by the court or by the commission or by the parties of the case, but we're more likely uh, receive legal and human rights um, arguments. But for this advisory opinion, the court will receive a huge amount of information and from um, different types of areas of expertise. Um, so this will be a very, very uh, participatory um, um, process. And actually not only because not, it's because um, the Organization of American States or the Inter-American Court and uh, that these limits um, the possibility of the UN engaging in this process as well. So we also know that the UN through um, some mandates, um, human rights mandates, the um, reporter on climate change, on the right to a safe environment, um, they will also um, participate as this is a very open process um, in which everyone can actually participate. So when the court invites um, all interested parties to participate, um, the court also fix uh, deadline uh, for written submissions. And we know that um, from the invitation, um, that was actually the third slide, Maria, if you want to show it, um, it will be August 18. Um, so um, the court has um, the tendency of extending this deadline at least um, uh, once um, in the past. And the court extends the deadline usually 90 days after the invitation um, and extends for 60 days. Um, so if the court um, does what it is, uh, what has done in the past with different advisory opinions and the deadline, and Maria, if you could both go back to the timeline, uh, the deadline would be October for, for the um, written submissions. And these will guide the date of the hearing um, because usually um, the hearing is, um, is announced um, 50 days after the final, final deadline for written submissions. So if October is our final, final deadline, uh, we would have the code calling for the hearing by the end of this year and the hearing would take place next year. So there is something very interesting about hearings at the Inter-American Court, um, specifically for, for, for this advisory opinion, um, only people who presented and states and corporations and the interested parties, um, only um, who presented the written submissions can uh, request uh, to participate um, in the hearing. And what is interesting about the hearing at the Inter-American Court is that um, the court um, sessions at the main headquarters is in Costa Rica, um, and they have their hearings there most of the time, but twice a year they have hearings outside uh, the headquarters. They were just in Santiago, Chile, um, having hearings. Um, Two weeks ago or a week ago. So this hearing could take place in Costa Rica or it could take place in an extraordinary um, session uh, which could be outside Costa Rica. Um, and for this specific advisory opinion, we have heard this is not official. Uh, we have heard that even the court is considering having um, three hearings for these, um, for this advisory opinion. Um, taking into account the number of organizations that are considering participating in this process, but also to go um, and have the opportunity to hear from um, different parties um, in different countries, which would allow uh, more access from uh, uh, organizations, corporations, 
states to engage um, in this process. And it's very interesting because um, also um, civil society are in the same level of states. Um, the code will define the time that everyone will have to speak, but we're not likely they will have the, more, the same time to present um, to the court. Um, so civil society um, is very strong um, in this process at the Inter-American um, Court, which is um, very important because we're talking about an issue that our previous panelists um, were speaking about how front by defenders are at risk. So they will, at uh, the Inter-American system, have more opportunity to engage in this process and participate and they can present, they don't need to be lawyers, right? So they can present directly information to, to the judges in this process. Um, and then um, if the hearing is early next year, we might have a decision by the end of next year. So usually the court takes 280 days um, to have an advisory opinion after the hearing. Um, because they need time to process the information that they have. And this is a very complex issue as well. Um, so if the court um, takes the same time that took in past, uh, in past advisory opinions, it would be 280 days. But take into account that this is a massive and very participatory um, uh, process, and they are considering maybe having more than one hearing, this could take longer, but we don't know. Uh, what we know so far is where the check is, right? That we just have for the moment won that line. Um, uh, other is speculation based on the previous um, advisory opinions. So I think that's about a little bit the process, Maria. Thank you. It's great. It's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, I have a few questions. If others have questions, you're uh, very welcome to put those in the chat. Uh, I actually also wanted to share something that I prepared as I was um, you know, preparing for this that I think might be useful because it has uh, sort of a, and I'm glad to see that I think I got most of the, the dates and deadlines right. Can you all see it? Um, okay. So I was trying to put together sort of these different deadlines that we have already, the different dates. Um, you know, obviously when we have the requests, then the written statements, the, we already have all the dates for that, obviously, except that the African one is not included here because there's nothing yet, but, um, and then potentially dates of the hearings and advisory opinions when that's expected. So I think it's more or less coherent with what, um, the four of you have been talking about. Um, and then below is that sort of on a more linear scale, how that's uh, likely going to happen. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that open for a little bit um, if others may find it useful. But I wanted to ask a little bit more about the, the hearings. Uh, Rodrigo talked a little bit more about it, but maybe the others could also expand a little bit on sort of um, what the structure of the hearing uh, is well, sort of how long does usually take, you know, uh, who can speak, how the process is for requesting to speak and um, things like that, if you can expand on that a little bit more. Can you, can we, we can start with, yeah, Julia, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, so I mentioned this briefly that in, um, past cases, there has been a combination of states who participated in written proceedings and in oral proceedings. Some um, actually, especially in Chagos, chose just to participate in the oral proceedings. Um, so that means in terms of um, participation in the oral proceedings, ICJ cases aren't, in terms of oral hearings, aren't the most dynamic and typically involves a written statement that has been prepared in advance and then circulated to the court in advance um, the night before. And the, in a contentious case, it would be the agent for the state who speaks first and then hands over to counsel. Um, and that is also typically what happens in um, advisory opinions. There aren't a lot of questions from the court generally, particularly because they're conscious that states often need to go back and communicate with capital before they're able to give an answer on the fly. Um, so the in Chagos, there was four days of hearings for um, I think about 23 states in the African Union. Um, I 
can't recall exactly how long their oral submissions were, but quite, quite short. So it wasn't getting into the real nitty gritty of the substance. As I said, that might be different here because there is so much to discuss. And also states may choose to use their um, uh, involvement in oral proceedings slightly differently in terms of rather than legal counsel, it may be the case that they choose to have youth activists speak um, as a way they could use. And this is just um, ideas of, you know, without um, any insight as to how they actually will be, but just ideas of potentially experts um, from their home countries about um, climate change issues. And so that might be, um, that might prompt questions from the court in a way that it hasn't in the past often. But typically they aren't, like I, as I said, the most dynamic of proceedings. Of course, they're still very valuable and they signal um, states' level of interest and commitment to the questions being posed and the court finds them quite useful. But it's, we don't have, because the ICJ statute doesn't formally allow for the involvement of, you know, civil society and NGOs, it's not, um, there probably isn't going to be a ton of differentiation between the written the submissions made in written proceedings and in oral statements. Thank you. Rosemary, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. I think the ITLOS is probably the most similar uh, to the ICJ in this respect. So everyone who submits to the written round will get an invitation to present arguments at the at the hearing as well. Um, and then it depends if they all take up that invitation. And I think the number of, of parties who want to present will determine the length um, of the hearings. Um, and it, it lost that usually also a consecutive number of days. Um, but similar to the ICJ, there's no formal provision for civil society or NGOs um, to take slots in that as well. Great. Well, do you have anything to add? I know you explained quite a bit about the hearings, but if you do you have anything else. Yes, just to say that uh, that the hearing is not mandatory if you look at the rules of procedure, but the court has been calling um, um, for hearings in every single advisory opinion, and I think that for these will definitely do because of the amount of information that they receive and the importance of the of the issue. Um, so yes, just to, to say that, and the court also can invite um, experts or organizations to present during the hearing. So um, this is also important to know. Okay, great. And I think we lost you, Robert, hopefully she will be joining in a bit. Um, I just have a follow-up question. Uh, I think, you know, obviously because of the nature of what we're discussing in these advisory opinions, the role of science is particularly important. So I was wondering, wondering whether, you know, like some like cases at the national level that uh, sometimes invites certain science uh, experts to talk a little bit about the, the science behind climate change, whether that may be a possibility for some of these advisory opinions um, as well, even in the hearings or, you know, generally sort of to, to comment on and how, and how much the courts might rely on that in the advisory opinions too. Yeah, so, Sorry, you were going to say something, Julia. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think um, in the case of the ICJ, um, it'll, of the ICJ advisory opinion, that'll kind of depend on how the states seek to use their um, written and oral submissions. So if states choose to include, you know, um, expert evidence in some way, or if they choose to use the findings of their domestic courts that refer to science and climate science, um, that could, that would probably be the most direct way in which it comes before the court. Same with international organizations if they choose to, you know, submit as exhibits or in their written submissions um, reference to, you know, the UN triple, uh, FCCC. The UN FCCC might itself, I, I'm not sure, but might um, ask to participate. And so that way you'd see science coming before the court. As I said, in oral proceedings, there, I don't think this has occurred in the past, but it could be the possibility that, um, a state hands it over to an expert to speak before the court. Um, I don't believe that there is a provision in the um, advisory opinion of uh, the rules about advisory opinions that would allow for the court to um, invite experts in the same way. But I, I'm happy to be corrected if you know the ICJ statute applies mutandus, mutandus to contentious cases and advisory opinions. Maybe there is a way, um, but I think it would 
probably be through states' um, choices about how they want to use their their time, and that's how to get before the court. Great, thank you so much, Rodrigo. Do you wanna? Yeah, so because as I said, the, the process at the Inter-American Court is very flexible and the invitation is open to all interested parties. And um, we do believe that um, the court will invite uh, scientific organizations or scientists to participate in the process. We have been talking to some of them and we know that they will um, present information to the court about scientific evidence and we also as justice initiative uh, we want to present information uh, about attribution science um, because it's something that is not um, very common um, uh, for uh, courts in in latin america uh, especially when they're like dealing with um, human rights cases. So we think that's very important that the court incorporates the definition of attribution science and includes this in the decision. And we have been partnered with um, some organizations and we know that or we hope that they will also be at the court presenting information directly. And um, the court is very receptive to, to information um, when, well, also about human rights. But, uh, also when it's not about human rights and can connect these to the case or the opinion that they're um, knowing right. That's great, thank you. Rosemary, do you wanna uh, jump in next? Yeah, maybe just to, to underline that I think the science bit is going to be the, the a really key and really interesting part and it's going to be indispensable, certainly in the, in the submissions to ITLAW. So I think it's a, a key thing for all actors to consider exactly how they're going to use the science in their submissions and importantly how they tie that to legal definitions and legal obligations and I think we'll see a mix of obviously reference to the IPCC report as sort of the international consensus on climate science as well as possibly you know especially commissioned scientific reports um, and a whole body of of evidence that's out there to support different elements as well right whether we're talking about ocean acidification global warming these are all related but they're technically quite distinct issues there's a wealth of science out there but tying that very um carefully into specific elements of the law i think will be really crucial um and something to go about very carefully in these submissions but i think the effect will be that the tribunal will be faced with um, a fair mountain of documents and evidence uh, that's not legal in nature to consider and it will be really interesting to see how they um, will use that in the end that's great thank you so much everyone um all right there are a couple of questions uh, on in the Q&A. So um, someone was asking about uh, to confirm the, the deadline for written submissions if that's August 15 and the second October deadline is the anticipated extension for written submissions or like sort of what did I think the question relates to what's the difference between these two uh, dates. Okay. So yeah, so what we know confirmed is that the first deadline is August 18. And as I was saying, the court has a tendency to extend the deadline. And if that's the case for this advisory opinion, it the second round of um deadline um for the second the deadline for the second round of written submissions would be October. But we don't have this confirmation yet. We might know this in April, May, June, in July, um, if the court will, will extend the deadline or not. But you can also always check on the court webpage, and that's where they publish um, all the notes and resolutions in regards to this advisory opinion. There is a session on advisory opinion, um, and you go to requests um, because it's not an advisory opinion yet. And then you can access all the notes related, the court notes related to this advisory opinion. Great, thank you so much. And, um... And Julia, for, maybe you can explain a little bit about the two different, the difference between the two dates as well, and uh, whether it's only the same organization, the same, the same states who can just reply to what have been has been said before, or if there are new submissions on the second deadline that the court has put forward. 
Yeah, I believe so. The first deadline is in October, and that's for written statements. That's basically your your typical first round pleading. Um, I believe, and then the second round is for written comments on those written statements. So I think by that um, nature, they are limited to states that already submitted um, written statements, and so that they can comment on others. I don't believe that states have come in and on the written comments stage and submitted, but states have come in on oral proceedings, so without having made um, written comments. And so just because, um, you know, maybe certain states didn't feel uh, prompted to make a written reply, but they've read the written comments and they want to come in um, later on in the proceedings for the hearing, they certainly are able to do so. Thank you. User Rat, welcome back. Uh, we have a question for you. <laughs> um, there was someone who was asking whether you could share a little bit more about the um, the African Union recognition criteria for organizations looking to bring advisory opinions before the African Court. Yes, I'm really sorry for that technical issue. I am back. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, <laughs> so, um, right, so the, the mysterious um, criteria adopted by the Executive Council. So, um, yeah, there are a couple of um, criteria. So, for example, you have to you have to have recognized standing within the particular field of competence. So, for example, in this case, um, it would typically, I think, have to be um, an an organization that works in environmental or climate related um, issues and does so. Um, fairly reputably or successfully. I know that these are a bit vague, right? Because, and that's probably intentional to leave some discretion to the uh, African Union as well. Um, but um, so that would just be in terms of being recognized as, as an organization, but then there's the second step of actually being, um, you know, of that, um, the African court considering that that has been, um, you know, sufficiently kind of met um, in the context of the case. So um, standing within the particular field of competence, um, purposes and principles that are aligned with uh, those of the African Union. Um, and then I believe you have to have been registered for at least three years in an African Union member state. So there's that. Um, and then there's, I think, another criterion with respect to your financial resources. So um, how the organization is kind of financially uh, run and it has to have a certain structure. So some elements that I think um, are put in place to kind of uh, reassure uh, the African Union that this is a legitimate kind of credible um, organization that is kind of worthy of having that kind of recognition, which would in a, in, in, a, in a next step kind of allow it to, amongst other things, make such a request um, to, to the African court, for example. Uh, but as I said earlier, I'm very happy to um, uh, share that uh, document if it could be helpful to the person who asked the question. That's great, thank you so much. Um, all right, there was another question to Julia to clarify uh, whether you and agencies could submit uh, inputs? Um, I believe if the UN agency is considered an international organization, I think some are, some aren't, they would uh, be able to. I'm not sure how formal that division is um, with the FAO. So um, I think there's probably a conversation going on amongst the secretariats or um, legal offices of these different organizations to see if they want to. As I said, the UN has been invited to um, provide information in the ICJ advisory opinion. In the case of ITLAS, um, I know that a number of UN organizations um, were invited in addition to the UN, so they are submitting um, they are submitting written proceedings for that proceeding. Be having already prepared one for it lost, they might seek to um, participate before the ICJ. But I, off the top of my head, I can't um, comment on definitively on whether the FAO is um, an international organization um, that would the court would consider to have information likely to assist it. 
Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Um, so another question for Yusra, considering that you know, all of these processes are ongoing and um, how helpful would the inputs from these processes be for the for the campaign and for the, the African court in particular as well? Yeah, I think they'd be hugely helpful, actually. I'm, I'm really optimistic about that because something quite unique about the African court is that um, its material scope with respect to its jurisdiction in the advisory context, it actually extends, so not only to the African charter, but to, um, and I quote, any other relevant human rights instrument um, so I th think there is some leeway for the court to interpret um, other instruments. It really depends on how you frame instrument, um, but it could so happen uh, that the court considers uh, that it, it is able to kind of comment and build on jurisprudence that will have come from the Inter-American Court on the same matter, the ICJ on the same matter, if those came out before um, the decision of the African Court, which was, you know, fairly likely, I think, uh, given where we're, where we're at. So I think it's actually, a, it could be a great opportunity, not only, if I can just go further, I think there could possibly even be an interpretation of, for example, the recent UN General Assembly or Human Rights um, Council resolutions on the human right to a healthy environment, for example, right? So um, I think that that would be a beautiful example of kind of cross-fertilization um, and allowing for reinforcement based on what other um, kind of courts and, and, and tribunals have said, while of course kind of honing in on um, the particularities of the African context. That's great, thank you. It's really useful. And I think as a follow-up to that, to the others as well, if you can comment a little bit on that cross-fertilization, I think, you know, looking at how, for example, the Committee on the Rights of the Child has um, built on the interpretation of the Inter-American Court's previous advisory opinion on extraterritorial responsibility. If we're likely going to see more examples of that, and I think part of what I wanted to ask to relates to, you know, obviously each of these processes is happening within their own legal systems, but they're all going to be looking at the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement as well. So that part, that sort of cohesion and um, holistic interpretation of these agreements obviously is very advisable, but I wonder, you know, if you have any thoughts on how likely it is that there is going to be that consistency. I'm happy to, to start us off, um, maybe from the IDLOS context. So as we've heard earlier today, the questions focus would appears to be quite narrowly on part 12 of UNCLOS, obligation to prevent, reduce, control pollution and to protect and preserve the marine environment. Of course, one important link there is indeed with the UNFCCC and Paris Agreement uh, in terms of emission reduction obligations. Um, but I think we shouldn't underestimate the significance of that second question as well, protect and preserve in the broader context also of, of adaptation, and not only reducing emissions, but protecting and preserving ecosystems, habitats and species that support that natural carbon, carbon cycling function of the ocean. And that ties into other instruments as well, like the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, but also procedural obligations that could be interpreted, for example, by reference to the new BB&J agreement, which contains more detailed um, provisions on environmental impact assessment, for example, and the need to take into account cumulative impacts, which could be particularly relevant in relation to ocean acidification, for example. So I think the hope is that to interpret these broad obligations under UNCLOS, which in previous uh, case law have already been interpreted by reference to the CBD as well as CITES, um, to draw out those links. Um, now, of course, that's somewhat limited in the sense that that will most likely not touch on, for example, human rights obligations. But if it loss would come to, you know, a more detailed interpretation of these um, obligations, there's a good chance that the ICJ further down the line for the element of their question that looks at impacts of the marine environment uh, will again defer to the interpretation that the IDLOS has given there. So in that sense, 
um, you know, the, the stakes are also high there for the Idlos to be ambitious and hopefully be invited to be as specific as possible about what these obligations entail and exactly how other instruments inform obligations and, and duties of care on the long clause. Okay, thank you. Julian Rodrigo, do you have anything else to add? Um, nothing um, major after that. I think um, Rosemary said, put it quite well. I think just as a general statement, obviously there's overlap between all these requests and there is serious concerns amongst people about the possibility that um, of inconsistent interpretations. But at the same time, there's a possibility of them being mutually reinforcing. And I think, you know, um, should it loss um, take an, an, an ambitious approach to um, discussing some of these principles and responsibilities and obligations, um, should a second uh, quarter tribunal then repeat those findings um, would be uh, quite powerful. And of course, advisory opinions are non-binding, but the more tribunals you have opining in the similar, you know, similar terms, broad strokes, if not exactly using identical language will be quite helpful. And I think um, I think we can be optimistic that the, you know, these are all individuals working at these courts who are going to try to be um, not intentionally obstructive. Um, of course, they're going to apply the law as they um, understand it. But I think that there certainly is a way um, forward where we will see um, these opinions reinforcing each other rather than undermining each other. Yeah, so I don't have much to add, um, Maria, but I think um, that, and so Professor and former judge Antonio uh, Cansado Trindade, which was a judge at the Inter-American Courts, also a judge at ICJ, he used it to say um, that there is a lot of like conversation, dialogue, and influence in um, international decisions by um, other international um, tribunals. So I think that the fact that there are four um, um, tribunals, well, at some point for tribunals so looking at climate change and climate emergency, it will be more likely that the, there will be some sort of um, connection and synergy um, and also overlap. Um, so I think that everything should and must be connected. And I think that it is really, I, I do believe that there is a lot of not only um, as scholars, lawyers are speaking, I think that also the courts are in the same process. That's great, thank you. Um, all right, we're almost at the hour. I know it's been a long uh, morning or afternoon and uh, we had really incredible input from all of the panelists, not only on this uh, panel, but the others, the others as well. Um, so maybe we can close, you know, inviting the panelists on this panel and who the panelists from the previous panels who are still here. There was a, a, a great question here on the Q&A about, um, what the participants would like to see the court to see in the advisory opinion. So I'll just ask, you know, from based on that optimism and that hope that these advisory opinions have brought, so what's the, what's the dream, the <laughs> response from the courts? If anyone, you know, wants to share it in the other panelists as well, please jump in. <laughs> If I might, if you allow us from the other panels, the hopes are so low that anything would be a dream. <laughs> so I imagine some of us may be more optimistic than others. A, a dream would be to have at least a symbolic decision, but because the devil lies in the details, uh, let's hope that whatever comes after these advisory opinions can be operational afterwards. That would be the best thing. If not, at least to have something symbolic that we can bring before states and say, look, you're infringing international law, so do something, at least that would already be meaningful. Okay, thank you. Anyone else has? Maybe to add a, a slightly more optimistic touch, because um, I was once taught you should never end on a pessimistic note, so we need to keep it going here. <laughs> um, I think that 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 
that interconnection with the science is where a lot of potential sits, even in how the courts use it, which could be of use even beyond climate change, right? In climate change, we have the benefit that there is a lot of science and it is a lot of consensus. Uh, for other examples of pollution of the marine environment, we don't have that as much. So how the court uses this, I think can have significance in a much wider spectrum of cases uh, in the marine environmental context. Um, another aspect I think is to really spell out and hopefully the tribunal will follow in this, the diversity of obligations that we find under part 12. We are not just general due diligence type obligations, but also procedural ones. Um, even to report, to assess science, to monitor, to conduct environment impact assessments, to cooperate, and any substance that can be given to any of those in the context of climate change could be an additional tool to what we have under the climate change regime, for example. So any of these elements that can be specified further, I think, even in and of itself, each of those have, have added value. Maybe I can add, just picking up on something um, that Margareta said in the second panel, just the kind of importance of court courts really sort of dwelling um, on key documents in a way that sort of brings them together. I think that in itself from a sort of international law point of view would be incredibly valuable. Um, of course, we want we want to see ambitious courts. It would be wonderful if this turned into a wild surge to the top, you know, each court trying to outdo the other. But but I think the the kind of art of these questions has been really in getting courts to sort of think through the interconnections as well between legal instruments, between different aspects of climate change, between obligations and repercussions of non-compliance. So I think that in itself is a, is a kind of important dimension of what we might get from these courts. Thank you so much, Dina. All right, any, anyone else has any final words? Okay, wonderful. So uh, I think uh, that's it for today. This is really supposed to be the beginning of a conversation around uh, this comparative approach of you know, the comparative an an analyses of these different processes. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, Dina is organizing this in-person workshop at the University of Southampton in June, and you're welcome to, um, to say an abstract to that. She just put the, the link in the chat and you can see. Uh, and we, would love to see you there in person um, and please reach out if there are other uh, opportunities, other things that you'd like to, to do to engage with us because I'm sure we'll be talking about this um, for the next few years and hopefully, you know, good things and uh, sharing that optimism and uh, these um, prospects come forward uh, as we want them to. Uh, all right, so thank you again uh, to you know, our, our moderators and our panelists, and we will see you all soon. Bye, everyone.